A little extra lettuce on this Tuesday. Welcome aboard the post-game show. Alongside Elijah Campbell, I'm Jay Phillips. Thank you so much for being with us. A lot to get to on today's program. A little bit of breaking news around college football. We'll touch on that for you. Uh, Derek Scott unavailable today. He's busy. So uh, should I do it? Should I do it? Should I do it? Do it. Stuart Lake will be pinch hitting for Derek Scott. Oh, look at that. Oh. So there's that. All right. I, That's breaking news. I don't know if I feel badly about doing that, but I, I, just, I had to do it. It was there. It's there for the taking. I, I Rarely am I the guy, rarely am I the guy that wants to pluck the low-hanging fruit on this program. But sometimes when the low-hanging fruit just looks really good, you just got to grab it. You got to go for it. So I did. You'd be or missed if you if you. Yeah. Um, Tyler Pitts are on the hill tonight. It's so, interesting. Yeah. Interesting decision there. Um, maybe this is who they are this season in terms of just uh, a rotation that isn't really set other than one guy. You know? Doesn't that make them hard to prepare for, too? In a way. Could. I guess, maybe. Could. But also, there's two sides this coin can make it hard to prepare for because you really don't know you know as an opposition who you're getting night in night out but at the same time if you're south carolina you're still figuring out who day two and day three starters are in yeah, weekend series I, and with copper's injury now you got to figure out who the midweek starter is while also managing your arms to see who's going to be available in the bullpen for the weekend i will that's tough contend that it would be better for mark and and matt if they if they knew what their rotation looked like through the weekend. Because it then allows you, I think, to set everything else up accordingly. Now, if you know, if you set it, then you at least you know what it's going to look like. Like this weekend, mm-hmm. you know, this, they, they, they took a game from A&M. Uh, you, need, you need to get, you know, you certainly need to get one of these, if not two, from, from Arkansas. Um <sighs> how you set everything up, you know, beyond tonight. Like, you need to win this one. You still want to have a chance to host, and that means you got to win your midweeks. you got a really nice midweek win last Tuesday up in Charlotte. Um, don't don't let up right now. You're, you're playing better baseball. I think there should be reason for encouragement from fans that Carolina had 15 extra base hits, scored 28 runs. The concern should still be there from fans that especially on Sunday when you did score nine runs that you were one for 15 with runners on base. Yeah. That's crazy. Like it's almost like that, that that defies baseball logic. And yet, you know, you it, again, like I said, if we, if you would if you had hit two hundred in that spot, maybe you win the baseball game. If all other things are equal, which we can't account for. But uh again, Will Tippett is no longer, at least in the short term, uh, going to switch hit. And as we talked about with coach yesterday, and then you and I followed up, you know. When you're a switch hitter, you're going to be batting, whether whatever your natural position is as a hitter, you're going to be hitting left-handed more often because you're going to be facing more right-handed pitchers. That's just how human humans work. You know, once you get to a more specialized level of baseball, which I would consider Southeastern Conference baseball to be, then certainly coaching staffs around the country or around the conference rather are are looking for as many lefties as possible i get it and and some staffs may have more than others and and have more than the percentage what is it one out of every seven persons mm-hmm. is left-handed i think something like that so you know some staffs may have more um but anyway y- y'all get that now will's just going to hit right-handed regardless of what the pitcher is and he had four hits this past weekend And maybe it gave him a little more confidence to not swing at as many things. He got a couple of walks. He hit a home run. He had a couple of doubles. He had a good weekend at the plate, four for 12. Um, You know, that's it it doesn't bring his conference batting average or season batting average up to a number that you're like, oh, okay. But considering where it was, you look at it again, you're like, oh, oh, well, that's a lot better, isn't it? I mean, he did quadruple his hit total uh, in conference play over the weekend. Yeah. So, you know, you, you got to keep doing some of those things. But we'll talk to Stewart coming up at the bottom of the hour. Uh, congratulations to Camilla Cardoso. Um, <laughs> there's, okay, I, <laughs> I'm certainly thrilled for her. Yes. We all around here and other parts of the country know that there um, was not a lot of goodwill between Camilla and Angel Reese this season. And four picks later, 
Angel Reese goes to the same team. It'll be okay, right? Oh, yeah. Camilla's a pro. I don't worry about Camilla. Angel, maybe. I don't know. Well, a, a vote. okay, so I'm going to do it. I'm, then I'm going to ask again. It, it'll be okay, right? It'll be chill. I think so. Right. But I. But also, at the uh, flip side of the coin, would I pay money to be at that first practice? A good amount. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Speak. Absolutely. That first inner squad scrimmage, <sighs> buddy, I want to put some I, – I want to go. I would – be able to be a fly on the wall. So I want to see what that first practice is like with them as teammates, but still going against each other. Because I was on the floor at the SEC championship game, and I could hear the trash talk yeah. that Angel Reese is giving at Camilla. Camilla now responded with a smile gracefully. But yeah. Yeah. a lot of the stuff that I heard on that floor, I cannot repeat on the air. And it was, uh, if I can get that in a quieter gym, I'd sign up for it. It seems like it may be all pent up in Camilla that day, and then in one burst came out yes um it was a slow build well you mentioned you know the practice and i'm not looking for drama here y'all know i don't do that i I, but it's just it it, again the drama we're here for the story it is a story it is certainly a story because that was one of the stories of the season of the sport absolutely that game that game yes Uh, in the sport well said yeah um but i wonder what it was like last night at the at the event I mean, there's probably some kind of post draft get together. Yeah, had to be. Yeah, and I'm uh, sure. They've I know Dawn and, call. And, and Lisa Boyer were there, uh, amongst other staffers, probably. Uh, but I know Dawn and Lisa were there. Sweet Lisa was just crying and hugging on Camilla like that. She was, she was so happy. It was great. Um, I don't, I, I don't know if Kim Mulkey was there. I, did she I, was. She was yeah. there. Okay. I, I didn't see her when Angel got drafted. I didn't see Kim, but I, I, so. Um, yeah, I wonder what that was like. And at this point, you know, did, did Kim and Dawn, like, tell them both, all right, now, listen, it's like like moms in the neighborhood. Y'all play nice now. You're on the same team. I don't know if that – Maybe. I don't know if that's possible. Or fun take here, uh, Kaylin from B106 did make a really funny meme today that we have on our Instagram page of, you know, putting Camilla and, and Angel's face on uh, John C. Riley and Will Ferrell from the movie Step Brothers, where it's like, did we just come best friends? Yeah. Yep. You want to do karate in the garage? Maybe it's that. Maybe after they realize. And Camilla said, she did say last night in the press conference that no one's going to get any rebounds on them. Yeah. Which is very true. If yeah. they're both in the game at the same time, good luck grabbing any boards. So, so maybe after they have their both, you know, they both get 15 boards in a game, they're like, you know what? Maybe we're pretty good at this. Uh, we can do this together. Aaliyah Boston uh, will now be teammates with Caitlin Clark. That's must see TV. Um, Caitlin Clark in the Indiana Fever and Aaliyah Boston in the Indiana Fever are going to be on some form of national television more than 30 times. That's 90% of their games. Yeah, what's their season? 40. I think they play about 40. Games There's 12 there. teams in the league. Is that right? I think, yes. Um, Wow, and did you see that? And I, I don't know who else might have had them last night. I guess Fanatics maybe has some type of exclusivity, but Fanatics sold out of pretty much every Caitlin Clark jersey they had. I don't know how many they made. Good of them to know in advance that she was going to get picked. <laughs> that was kind of <laughs> if Indiana pulled a fast well, one. Well, I'm sure there, you know. What, what if they had done that, you know? Uh, the Indiana Fever select Rakia Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the reaction would have been, uh, if the draft is held on April 1st, they should have done that. Yeah. And then, like, April Fool's. That would have been funny. Just to see the reaction, because the Fever definitely had, like, a watch party at their arena. That was packed but, to watch that pick. But uh, I did I did watch a little bit. We'll see now, you know, now, now the hard part, right? Now the hard part. Now you're, now you're a pro. Now you're expected to put a league on on your shoulders to some degree. Uh, she won't do it alone, obviously. But it, it let's let's see, let's see. Uh, you know, I, I think there will be more interest in the WNBA because mm-hmm. of Caitlin, and and the, and then others will obviously be like, oh, she's good. Oh, she's good too. Oh, hey, I I remember her when she was in college. Hey, oh. Like that. That's kind of how it works, right? Yep. So. I'll grow the sport. We'll see. Great for the league. We'll see. But uh, watch a little bit of that last night for you. So we'll get into that. Um, Shane Beamer has spoken today. We'll get you some of that coming up in the 5 o'clock hour. Coach uh, getting ready for the spring game. I know he and Coach Paris are playing in the uh, Heritage Pro-Am tomorrow. Probably a quick down and back, but uh, go 
go rep to you. That's right. right. Who wins between the two? I don't know. I don't know how good Lamont. Uh, Shane's a good golfer. Uh, I don't know how good Lamont is. I've I've actually uh, had the opportunity to play with Coach Beamer on a couple of occasions, but I have not uh, had a chance to play with Coach Paris. I don't know if our own Bill Gunner has had a chance to play with Coach Paris. Now I've never seen Lamont the Savant play golf, right? But I have. I do participate in a lot of press conferences and he does a lot of golf analogies um so i know he loves the sport he, i don't know how good he is but i assume if you love it like that and you do often cite different analogies when comparing basketball and golf in terms of mental like you know the mental aspect of it then right. you got to be at least you got to be decently good you know he's got i i think he's got a golfer's mentality and and aura you know uh there's a lot, yeah, like you say, there's there's a lot of cerebral aspects to mm-hmm. it. Uh, calm, quiet, you know, most of the time kind of a guy. And he has the build of a golfer, too. And that, I mean, all, all of us can go play golf, but he, like, he has the build of more of a, like, good golfer, you know? I could see him being a good golfer. Uh, yeah, I could, too. So would you make, I guess, because you know, you know Shane can play. Shane so can you, play. You make Shane I, I don't the know favorite what, right now. I don't know. Well, I don't, well, I... The no, not necessarily. Know. I don't know enough about what Lamont does, so I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to put that on either of them. My apps would like to know. Yeah, uh, I I don't know. Again, Shane. I I mean, I think Shane can go out on a lot of golf courses and shoot. Like, I don't know how much he gets to play anymore, but I would think Shane can probably shoot in the seventies a lot. That's impressive. I think he can. Very I mean, nice. I, you know, I, he's he's good. He he's good. I, I remember the first time I was like, oh, oh, you're one of those guys. You play for real. Yeah. Like, I, didn't, I, I just figured you came out to, like, have fun as a football coach. I didn't know you could play. I play as an excuse to You know who's good? Plays. Uh, is G.A. Mangus. Really? Yeah. Coach Didn't Coach G.A. That. can play, man. And he he's he's legit. And he, when I say he takes it seriously, I don't mean, like, he's going to beat you up or something. But, I mean, G.A. can play. He takes it seriously as yeah, in. He, he's, he's good. He's He's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's you know what I mean. Oh, yeah, like you've been those. around some of those guys. Like he's oh, I remember I was down when I used to when I worked at Myrtle Beach many moons ago, high school. But we played with a guy, a friend of a friend, right? Mm-hmm. And the friend said they live down there. I mean, I'm from here, but I was working out there in the summer, for, you know. And and the guy was like, yeah. Um, now listen, he's good and he takes it really serious. And he, like he didn't want anybody yucking it up. No, no mulligans, like. You know, he doesn't hit it in the woods oh, kind he, of a he thing. he wouldn't want to play with me, yeah. You know, and, like, no stopping at the turn for a hot dog and, and like, a 10-minute break. Like, He's locked go. in. Like, like, you know, and, and honestly, man, that wasn't a lot of fun. I was like, I know, you're really good. That's cool. Like, I, I tip my cap, sir. But uh, not, not cool. Not cool. I, it's just, it's not fun. I'd rather go out and shoot, you know. Or play with somebody that's also going to shoot in the 90s. I'll break triple digits. We'll have a lot of fun. That's good. Whatever it takes. All right. Uh, We'll come back on the other side. Breaking news in college football that you will want to get to. And uh, we'll stay with football for this hour. Because not just Carolina football. Well, indirectly Carolina football. Yeah? Is that a good way to put it? Yeah. Indirectly. Okay. Okay. Indirectly Carolina football. But uh, on the other side, breaking news uh, around one of the big names in college football. This is the Post Game Show.
Uh, make sure you're tuned in for that. I'll tell you that much. That, that could be big. In the meantime, I want to tell you about Dr. Dan Balknight and his staff at the Men's Clinic of South Carolina. They're out in Irmo. Dr. Dan is a fantastic guy. Uh, listen, guys, whatever your age, you know, especially if you're over 40 these days, I'm going to say, you don't feel like you did when you were in high school or college. You got something wrong. And sometimes you're like, eh, I'm fine. It'll go away. And, you know, the odds are it won't. Go see Dr. Dan in the men's clinic if you're just not feeling like yourself. Comprehensive blood work, lab work, a comprehensive consultation. Just talking to you about who it is that you are, what you do every day. They'll get you back to feeling the way you want to feel. There's no one size fits all. It is all about you and what you get from Dan Balknight. Check him out when you go to themensclinicsc.com and learn more about what Dr. Dan and his crew can do for you. Welcome back into the postgame show on this Tuesday afternoon. Jay Phillips, Elijah Campbell with you. Appreciate you being with us. Uh, again, Stuart Lake, uh, the coach, will join us at 4.30 today from down in Charleston, Gamecocks and the Citadel tonight. And we'll have sound from Coach Shane Beamer coming up for you in just a bit. Before we get to some news around uh, a few things going on with the Gamecocks, let me get you the latest from the NCAA on Michigan football. 
Uh, it was announced today that Michigan will get three years probation. Uh, there's a couple of assistant coaches that will have one-year show cause orders tied to their employment. All of this uh, was negotiated with the NCAA and, and stems around all of the different things that we remember, you know, whether you want to say it was Jim Harbaugh taking kids out for cheeseburgers and things like that, which, you know, was certainly part of it. A um, couple of, you know, dead period violations during COVID. Um, you know, Jim, and, and, and there's others. Jim had, uh, you know, staffers uh, on the field when he wasn't supposed to, and I don't just mean Wild Stallions. Yeah, that's a staffer that was on other fields yeah, when he wasn't supposed right. to. Um because, you know, some some analysts are not allowed to be on the practice field. They can only be in, like, film rooms and meeting rooms and stuff. And, you know, Jim doesn't care. Rules are suggestions. Yeah. And, and Michigan basically admitted today that uh, they, weren't, they weren't monitoring it. Um, and that's – I'm not here – I'm not – I didn't think this thing was going – once Jim left – I didn't think this was going to be as bad for Michigan, and clearly Michigan wanted to do whatever they could to mitigate the damage. So, again, they go into a a joint meeting uh, with the infractions committee. Now, there is a caveat. The NCAA is not happy with the fact, and it doesn't name him, but they are not happy with the fact that Jim Harbaugh didn't cooperate in this investigation. And they, they said as much uh, in their statement. I'll read that to you. Um, the committee will not discuss further details in the case to protect the integrity of the ongoing process as the committee's final decision, including potential violations and penalties for the former coach, is pending. The, the negotiated resolution involved the school's agreement that the underlying violations demonstrated a head coach responsibility violation and the former football coach failed to meet his responsibility to cooperate with the investigation. The school also agreed that it failed to deter and detect the impermissible recruiting contacts and did not ensure that the football program adhered to rules for non-coaching staff members. Now, you know, any of these things by themselves aren't all that big a deal. Everybody gets that. That's why Michigan fans were always in an uproar. It's just cheeseburgers. No, it's a willful violation of the rules. Is it over cheese? I mean, and where do – look, again, I'm not really here to judge because this has been done now. But I, the, the cheese the, – it's just cheeseburgers bothered me. And maybe we talked about this, you and I, maybe not. I can't remember last fall uh, for when we started working together daily. But one of the rhetorical questions I asked Elijah was, okay, what if, what if you know, Shane Beamer had taken somebody to Halls? Is, is that too much? Or is that, oh, it's just a steak dinner? Like, at what price point at a restaurant? I'm fortunate enough, to, I've, I've been to Nobu 57 in New York City. Amazing. It's quite the name drop there. It ain't cheap. And it ain't a place unless you got a lot of scratch that you you don't go very often. But my wife and I really wanted to splurge one night. Worth it. Probably won't do it again because I've done it once. And you could go to halls a couple of times. I'll just say like that. Without taking out a loan to do so. But it was amazing. Is that too much? I get you see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to. I'm, I, so the point is, what what restaurant, what level of food purchase makes people that otherwise would say it's just cheeseburgers go oh well and he took them to that place well i guess that is breaking the rules hey this is where the ncaa should step in and have it equated with your school's athletic budget if you have a very large athletic budget like you're in the sec the best you can do is carabas that's it <laughs> that is it but if you're like in the socon or you are you know fcs you have unlimited you can take them to hell's kitchen in las vegas there you go don't care yeah. anywhere yeah. anywhere at all but if it's like Alabama football, Kentucky basketball, steak and shake. That's the, that, that's okay. the, that, that's the best you can do. All right. Anything with a dollar menu. I got to tell you, you for, for, uh, for a big chain restaurant, Carabas is, really, is, is good. Carabas is good. Yeah. I, I like was it. a kid. That's, that, was, uh, that was my dad's favorite place to go whenever on vacation. That was uh, the other. Uh, and we I'm, I'm going to. That's how you knew he was splurging. I'm going to severely air quote here. The other Italian 
national chain restaurant? Not so much. Italian and italics. Yeah. <laughs> not not so much. But Carabas is pretty good. Um, I'm so, so but no, but to come back and be serious, like so, okay, it's not. It's, it's a willful violation of the rules, and you did it a lot. There there are several different instances of willfully violating the rules of the NCAA. I, again, if you think they're stupid rules, okay, you still can't break them if they're rules on the books. And if you get popped, you're going to have to pay a price. And Jim didn't want to come because Jim remembers his NFL days. Long time NFL player, right? And then a good run at San Diego where probably nobody was paying attention. And a good run at Stanford where a few people were paying attention. And then a nice run at the Niners where everybody's paying attention, but there's no rules against any of this. You can have a thousand analysts on the field. A thousand burgers for all your yeah, players. Yeah, you can take them wherever you want, man. But then you go to Michigan, and guess what, Jimmy? Everybody's watching, and there's rules. And it was COVID. So it's not just cheeseburgers. Um, I don't know. Jim Harbaugh's not coming back to college football ever at this point in his life. I'd be I'd be stunned if he did. And Especially since there's a show cause now. Yeah, you know. But look, he's he's gonna he's gonna do all he can to win the Super Bowl with the Chargers, and I think they're gonna have a really nice opportunity in a couple of years. I do because I think he's a fantastic football coach. I know he's a fantastic football coach. Um, and again, none of this crap matters anymore. But so how do you can't really come after him? I mean, well, you can't touch him now. No, he's he is in the the safe zone. This isn't this isn't the legal system. Mm -mm. He just violated rules of a college football game. So if he ever wants to play col or coach college football again, then he can face uh, consequences. But because he is out of college now, I won't say he's untouchable. Yeah. But he uh, um, the official statement also says by separating the cases, in other words, they've got these with the assistants that are still around and the negotiated settlement with the school for the probation. Uh, and a fine, uh, but the case against Jim Harbaugh is still just there. The committee's official statement says, by separating the cases, the Division I Committee on Infractions publicly acknowledged the infractions case and permits the school and the participating individuals, I love that, <laughs> participating individuals, to immediately begin serving their penalties while awaiting the committee's final decision on the remaining contested portion of the case. That decision will include any findings and penalties for the former coach. This is the fourth case where the committee has used multiple resolution paths. Um, and include any findings and penalties. So they'll have the findings. They'll say what they believe the penalties will be. And then those penalties will never be served. So who's going to pay that price? No Sharon one Moore. or Michigan. Yeah. She's for, or you know, Congrats, Sharon. You have a job as the head coach at the reigning national champs and one of the more storied programs in college football. Because they're going to reward. They're going to want somebody's head to roll a little bit. Someone's going to suffer for it. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's. And where if you're in the NCAA, you need to pick somebody. Pick someone who's on the staff. But in terms of anything, you know, massive coming down upon Michigan football, I I don't think that's going to happen. Nothing massive. I mean, and I don't know how much of this has to do with the Wild Stallions. I think that's probably a whole separate thing. That one's still going to take uh, an NCAA years, you know. They should put that dude in like the like the old days, like the stocks where you throw tomatoes at people. <laughs> so that's what they should do to that guy. That's his form of public shaming. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if we still did every once, just every once in a while, like every one thousand cases. Get to let make somebody in, do that. Put him in the stocks and throw tomatoes at him. I don't want to hurt him too bad. Or here's a good one, you know, because he wanted to be a Central Michigan coach so bad, sit him in a room and make him watch an endless loop of Central Michigan football, and that's it. That's it. For days. Uh, some potentially good news for a former Gamecock that's uh, headed off to the pros. Elijah and I will explain when the postgame show continues.
Homeowners looking to make improvements around the house, update that kitchen to something more modern, maybe a playroom for the kids, add on a back porch, whatever it might be. Uh, listen, don't take out one big lump sum and then pay interest on that for the next few years. Instead, call Palmetto Citizens Federal Credit Union. Unlock your home's equity and access an equity line of credit over a 10-year draw period. That way, you can do the kitchen. And then later, as the kids get bigger and you want that playroom or they need that extra bathroom or whatever it might be, then you're you're doing that when you want to. Apply today. Visit palmettocitizens.org or stop into any of their 14 convenient Midlands locations. Talk with their professionals about all they can do for you. All your banking needs, checking, savings, credit cards, car loans, mortgages, equity lines, student loans, you name it. Palmetto Citizens can get it done for you. Doing it for more than 85 years, Palmetto Citizens achieve your potential. All right, time to talk a little NFL mock draft as we're just uh, a few, well, a little over a week away from the draft, but it's coming up pretty soon. It'll be in Detroit, right? Detroit, Michigan this year, I believe, is where the draft is. I think so? Question mark? 
I don't even remember where it's at. See, you were supposed to do your Ron Burgundy or anything. I'm Ron Burgundy. Uh, the drafts got, in Detroit. So we, we've got we've got competing mocks going on at ESPN. Now you've got the exclusive to Mel Kuyper mock, yes? Yes. I'm trying to pull that back up because I pulled up the wrong one. Okay. See what ESPN needs to do, and what they don't do a good job of is deleting the old ones. I don't want to read the one from January. No. And now I just now got back to where. I, I have the latest, so we're good. But uh, you know what? It shouldn't take me three clicks to get no, there. No, that's fair. It should not. I have in front of me a combined Mel Kuyper Field Yates mock top 100 picks. So we're going to talk for a second about Xavier Leggett because in both of these that we have in front of us, the, the former Gamecock from Mullins is now a first-round pick according to these mm -hmm. professionals. Uh, I'll start. Elijah and I were talking this morning, and uh, I guess Patrick Mahomes is pretty heavily involved in what the Chiefs are going to do, There's a and there's a real feeling that they're going to be uh, getting him another weapon. And so he has been helping Andy Reid and, you know, the staff – evaluate a lot of these guys like hey who fits the all you know he's not going to get the final say but listen you should I, I quite honestly for a second if i may yes a guy like this especially should have plenty of say in who he's going to work with he doesn't get to make the final call despite his salary despite his prowess i understand that you know the owner is going to ultimately do that mr hunt knows what he's doing they've 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 given Andy Reid and that organization, a big platform now to be the best team in football. Um, but, you know, you, you should have a say in who you're going to work with. So that, that's good to know. Uh, and apparently Patrick has been diving into a lot of the film and, and, and evaluating a lot of these guys, and by now he knows what's up. So I just say that to go, all right, you're, you're thinking they're going to be getting him a weapon. Uh, the Field Yates slash Mel Kuyper first round concludes obviously with the Kansas City Chiefs your Super Bowl champion picking Xavier Leggett who until this week had basically been seen and projected as a top of the second round wide receiver potentially even with the first pick of the second round to the Carolina Panthers um, the write-up and then I'm going to toss it to Elijah for what he has because it's interesting that it's different basically a day later. Uh, though he had just one year of legitimate college production, Leggett has the size, power, and explosiveness to provide major upside to the Chiefs offense. Uh, Field Yates technically wrote that according to what I'm looking at, but again, they say combined Yates and Kuiper pick but there's a little something different here now if I'm not mistaken that Elijah has in front of him so uh, apparently so this morning when I looked or this morning a couple hours ago when I looked Mel Kuiper had Xavier Leggett all the way up to 29 to the Detroit Lions who are picking and see this is where I have I have conflicting mocks because that's the one I looked at earlier today and then the one from April 10th has him going to 32 to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And in the one where he has him going to Detroit at 29, he does make a slight accusation of height flubbing. Uh-oh. He did say, and he won't hold it against him, he said South Carolina did list Xavier Leggett at 6'3 when Mel Kuyper says he is 6'1. So there is a height flubbing accusation here. Interesting. But at the same time, uh, the mock draft that I have readily available. There are too many. Also, delete the old ones. ESPN, for the love of God, delete the old ones. It shouldn't take this long to find the specific one. However, he does have very good, a very interesting, thorough um, thorough discussion about Xavier Leggett post-combine, because this is really where his stock has risen. Uh, he says, another mock draft, another wideout connected with Chiefs to end round one. So there's a connection. Mel, Mel Kuyper, most, most of the time, when he makes his mocks, doesn't do it because he's evaluating talent. He's doing it because he's hearing stuff. Yeah. And he's getting things from certain GMs and, and coaches and, and, you know, league personnel. And there's a difference in his big board and yes. his mock draft. Significant difference. Yes. One is 100% Intel-fueled. Right. And given what we know, 
about you know Patrick Mahomes having a little more input on this year's draft because they've drafted a defensive player in the first round several years in a row now, or at least with their first pick. Yeah. They've taken a defensive player. Yeah. But here he says, another mock draft, another wideout connected with the Chiefs to end round one. Leggett made a leap in 2023, putting up 1,255 receiving yards with seven touchdowns. He had just 167 yards in the entire 2022 season. He then ran an eye-popping 4.39 second 40-yard dash at the combine, solidifying himself among the top 10 prospects at his position. Kansas City added Marquise Brown, but needs to add more pass catchers this offseason. I think he would even be the number one receiver over Marquise Brown, especially in a, from a stability standpoint. Listen, all I can say is I think that'd be fantastic for him. We know he's got all the tools and talent. And, yeah, I was just looking it up. Carolina did uh, list him even last season at 6'3", 227. I'm looking at Carolina's website from, well, again, going back to last year. So not anything they did since since Pro Day or the Combine. Um, so the Combine listed him at 6'1", you're saying? I, mm-hmm. I'm curious. Does care and I, I don't know. I don't really care that much. And like you said, Mel maybe doesn't either. Did Carolina measure all these dudes in their cleats, and the combine measures them in their bare feet? Like I don't like, seriously. I got you know. Is that maybe? I mean, when he's we in, know who's got the high. We, we know who has the tallest cleats now. I mean, when he's in cleats, you know, maybe not two inches taller, but if you're a little more than an inch above where you are with bare feet, yeah, why not round up? Yeah, I'd absolutely round up. You know, I do that on my license. Yeah. Uh, I rounded up a little bit. So, yeah, yours says, what, 7'4"? Yeah, exactly. I'm Zach Eady's height. There you go. Um, Rounded up a foot. Listen, again, I I don't know. Uh, uh, So much of it depends on need. Um, You're always looking to get better. You're always going to have some form of roster turnover, right? 10 15% roster turnover is pretty common these days Mm -hmm. in the NFL. Maybe even more. Maybe more like 20%. I mean, think about it. I mean, heck, 10% is only five dudes. You're probably turning over more than five dudes. Oh, significantly, yeah. So, that, yeah. That's just a free agency alone. Yeah, 20% is, I mean, there's 10, right? Um, that's math. So, thanks. Uh, yeah. thank, thank you, Ms. Ravenel. You never forgot. <laughs> you never forgot. Of course, by the time I had Ms. Ravenel, I better have known things like that. That was like seventh grade, so... Yeah, you'd be amazed. <laughs> yeah, you would you, with me. You'd be amazed. You would. Um, there's one math teacher I won't thank. She was mean. She I, doesn't, doesn't no, deserve a mention. I'm not, I'm not gonna thank her. She was mean. Still, still smarting about that one. Yeah, I yeah. got one of those too. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I, that'd be I'd be I'd be thrilled for the kid. Um, now we just wait and see. But I, I do think it's telling to your points about, about what we've seen in the last week or so within the week um, that now he's moved into the first round. That's, that's not, oh, we watched some more film of him. I watched him run the 40 again. It's, it's the buzz. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's the buzz. And, and now what? You know, now it's like, see, I, and this comes back around. I think you and I sort of predicted this. Like, man, you don't want to be the guy. And I'm talking the GM now. You don't want to be the guy that didn't take this guy when you mm-hmm. could. Especially with the value at the back end of the draft when you have an elite quarterback. Because, look, the teams that are going to be looking for wide receivers at that point of the draft, Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes, Bills with Josh Allen, and the Lions who have basically everything but an elite quarterback, but a good quarterback. Mm-hmm. And they're also going to be in the market for an extra wide receiver to bolster that you know group of weapons that they have. He's going to be in a good position if he gets taken in the first round just because of the teams that are picking. We'll tell you what Field and Mel think the Panthers are going to do. No, they don't have a first-round pick, but we'll tell you what they think about what's going on in Charlotte when the postgame show continues.
so Elijah and I looked it up. Uh, welcome back in, by the way. Jay and Elijah with you here on this Tuesday. Uh, again, University of South Carolina 2023 roster. So this was put out, you know, last summer, I suppose. Uh, Xavier Leggett, six foot three, two 227 pounds. Uh, the NFL Combine measurement, Xavier Leggett, Mullen, South Carolina, University of South Carolina, six foot one, two hundred twenty-one pounds. So again, my question is: Did Carolina measure their players in cleats and pads? And at the combine, are you just in like t-shirt and shorts and bare feet? We have a controversy in our hands now. Hey, we need to get to the bottom of this. Where's Cloniger? We'll call. It. Well, we'll sum. We'll summon them yeah. and say, "Hey, we we've got a lead. There's an accusation that's been made, yeah. and we got to get to the bottom of it." Yeah, I mean, these are the things that matter. But Mel Kuyper says he's not mad, and he won't hold it against X. Is he just disappointed? Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, the three round mock draft that uh, Mel Kuyper and Field Yates of ESPN have put out today uh, starts uh, off with the second round, and the Carolina Panthers, of course, you know. Uh, through the benevolence of David Tepper, uh, don't have a first-round pick. He was so generous in getting Bryce Young's pick last year that he gave the Bears a couple of first-round picks, and DJ Moore. And, you know. He's really doing his buddies a solid. Yeah, he's a nice guy. Uh, they have a projected trade here. Uh, the Rams would trade with the Carolina Panthers for pick number 33. Uh, the Panthers would get the Rams pick at 52 and 83, and a third-round pick in 2025, uh, which Field Yates wrote, uh, that aligns with the trade value charts. Carolina would now have four picks on day two to improve its roster. Should they do that, or should they keep the first pick of the second round? That's the interesting one for me. I... Here's the thing. You figure out, you don't, you, don't, you don't do this ahead of time, obviously. You let the first round conclude. And then overnight, if you want to start talking trades, then, then you do. But if you see somebody who's still on the board, then you're not doing it, right? Like, that's how I would look at it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So 33 is still, for all that's intents a good purposes, pick. that's a first round pick. Yeah. Basically. I mean... You know, even a top any top forty pick. I mean, you're feeling good. Some guys just don't. And again, it's it's a lot of it is about need. But um, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Uh, they don't have. Um, I'm making sure they didn't. They, we've updated this. They do not have uh, Spencer Rattler going in the top 100 at this point in time. So probably a fourth round pick i've been told uh oh no here he is no Bert, they do yeah, yeah, they, yeah there it is, there it, is. it was updated to my denver broncos how did i miss that before uh spencer rattler to the denver broncos with pick number 76 denver's patience at quarterback pays off here rattler could certainly compete with jared stidham for the starting job right away oh god don't do that to him not in denver not yet i don't mean that about spencer either <laughs> <laughs> let's not, Starting off the bat. Let's not, let's not, right do, let's not bat. do that to him yet. Uh, Rattler threw for 3,186 yards last season and has a good, has had a good pre-draft process. Uh, I just completely missed that one. I was going through this earlier. So, all right, um, I'll take that. Go Broncos, man. Broncos need something. Further incentive to get you excited to actually watch the Denver Broncos play football this year. Yeah, uh, I, I'm still a sucker. Um, but I... Uh, weapons man the broncos are an interesting one just because you know the, because of the quarterback question obviously they have parted ways with russell wilson so do you wait to get spencer wait, russell wilson round? was a bronco Sur surprisingly he wasn't just the guy that beat the broncos in the super bowl he actually suited up for them and also cost them some games there as well so I missed that must have been asleep if there was a uh, the ultimate bronco villain was their quarterback for a, a couple of years sorry you missed it but he was their quarterback and is not anymore. So do you take a guy in the first round? I've seen some mocks that have them with Bo Nix. How would you feel about Bo Nix? Pleased? Thumb up, thumb down? Or would you wait until the third round to get Spencer Rattler? Would that be a better option? I'd rather see them honestly get better at a couple of places 
to allow for a quarterback to have more to work with as a Denver Bronco fan. They they need some help up front on both sides. They've Very they've true. they've they've made some trades on defense that have hurt them, and the defense is still not terrible. Um, Receivers, you know, Judy, Jerry, Judy, yeah, Judy's yeah. gone, so you've got to you got to yeah, you've got to replace him. Um, I would not put, you know, don't don't go get a first round quarterback. You don't you, you need help. Help. And you so. can find quarterbacks in the NFL, and I think Sean Payton would like to do that. Uh, Team USA is about set for the Olympics. We'll do that for you and talk to Stuart Lake about tonight's game. Be right back.
Four o'clock on this Tuesday afternoon. Welcome back into the post game show along with Elijah Campbell. I'm Jay Phillips. Thank you so much for being with us. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, we'll talk to Coach Stuart Lake. Now, of course, the Gamecock color analyst. Uh, he'll be on the call tonight as Carolina takes on the Citadel. A uh, chance for Carolina to continue uh, a, a pretty good week overall. Uh, the win against AM to close that series, the win against North Carolina, taking two against Florida. And Arkansas coming in. By the way, uh, the one and only Josh Yellman has let us know here at the station uh, that later to today, like this afternoon, during this show, in fact, probably at least once during this hour, we will give you a chance to win tickets to the Sunday series finale, Gamecocks in Arkansas. So two chances to win a pair of tickets coming up before the postgame show ends this afternoon. And that was a big game. So please stay big tuned. Big game. Please stay tuned for that. In the meantime, uh, I don't know if it's like Wednesday or Thursday or something. This week uh, marks 100 days until the Olympics. Uh, I, and I, I know that because I watch the Today Show most days, and it's on NBC, and NBC has the Olympics, and they're like Mike Tirico is going to be over there and some other people. So they were talking about that. So that's later that's this exciting. week. exciting. Regardless, Team USA is finalizing its roster to go try to win a fifth consecutive gold, I believe. Uh, that's Which just doesn't sound right. It should be that's like... 8, 12, 16, 20. Yeah, this would be the fifth consecutive fifth. gold. Yeah, how'd they not win in 04? Because nobody gave a crap. That's right. A weird ensemble of, of players. Obviously, all all-star players, but a weird ensemble. But the dudes that just didn't... They didn't sh- you know, they didn't care. You know, it's crazy. That team starred Tim Duncan and still didn't win a gold he, medal. He probably cared. He might have, yeah. I don't know. Just just, just didn't have it. Anyway, uh, Grant Hill is now the Team USA Managing Director, and uh, they have put out most of the roster. It's interesting, though. They're going to hold one of the 12 slots open until uh, the July training camp. So, like, I mean, you're cutting somebody that's making 20 mil a year. <laughs> a max player, more than likely. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Probably more player, than 20 so. mil a year. Maybe 30 to 35 or 40 a year. Uh, LeBron James will be on the team. Steph Curry will be on the team. Kevin Durant will be there. Joel Embiid, uh, who is American now, if you were wondering, like, wait, he's not American. He's from Cameroon. He is an American citizen now, though. Uh, just like when Akeem became an American player, which was just like, oh, my God. I'm, yes. Yeah. Man. He was good at basketball. <sighs> Best footwork of all time? Maybe. I've told you before, right? Players? I think I've told that, that my first NBA game in Charlotte was was Hornets against the Rockets. No, you did not tell me that. You told me your Allen Iverson story. Okay. Was I was, really yeah, cool. I, was, I was on courtside next to Allen. But but uh, my, my buddy Andrew and I, uh, it was Christmas break. We were in high school. I guess that was 88, right? Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, I forget exactly what day. Anyway, we had tickets lower level in the corner. And I know the Hornets lost a close game, but all I cared about, I was like, dude, that's Akeem. Like up and down the floor the whole night. I was like, I am, I'm in the same place as Akeem Olajuwon. Fixated. It was awesome. It, it was, so that was my first experience with the NBA in person. I'd watched a ton of NBA on television, obviously, but I had never been, I never went to a Hawks game. When growing up, I went to tons of Braves games, went to a few Falcons games, but we just, nobody in my family gave a crap about the NBA. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had never gone in person to an NBA game, but my first one in Charlotte, that I, I, I could still see it, man. Like there was, I was like, oh, there's a Kiva Lodge one. That was the best. Whew, he was something else. Anyway, uh, where was I? Oh, Joel and B. Okay, so here's the rest of it. Anthony Davis, Devin Booker, who loves him some Devin Booker. Yes. Uh, Anthony Edwards, Jason Tatum, Drew Holiday, Bam Adebayo, and Tyrese Halliburton. Um, Steve Kerr will be the head coach. And, uh, again, there are several guys that will be invited. I don't, I'm not even going to sit here and try to guess who the 12th player on the roster will be. Um, there's a nice mix already. Oh, guys, uh, I'm looking here. Would you say there's a 
true what like Drew Holiday, he's not a true one, no. He's not a one. He's a uh, he can play. combo guard. Yeah. I think is probably the so, proper verbiage there. Yeah, because he and Steph kind of con- right? Like there's no true yeah. one. And like in that Steve Kerr, Phil Jackson triangle offense system, there's no true point guard. So I don't know if you're looking for one. Of the, I don't know how many of those are left in the NBA. I don't NBA. even know if you need one, yeah. especially on this team. So many guys can handle the ball. ball. Drew Drew Holiday is there to D up. Um, I mean, so I don't I don't know. I would you 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 follow more closely than I? Is there is there someone that's you know clearly not on this list that you would go like, oh well, you got to put so and so in? Well, I would say I, I would say Tyrese Halliburton's probably the closest thing to a true point guard because I I don't I need to go back and see if he finished the season, but at one point this year he was averaging 11 assists per game, and that's very pretty. very few players in the history of the sport finish a year like that. He actually finished at 10.9. So if you want to round up to 11, okay. for all intents and purposes, he then you don't need a, then you don't need a one. 11 assists. You have yeah. When Tyrese Halliburton's in the game, you know, you'll let him you know be a magician, average you know 20 points, basically 11 assists. Uh, he is not one of the few players on this team that have not appeared on an All NBA list. Um, the only other one would be Anthony Edwards, but that will uh, that will change this year because I think both those guys will be All NBA players. But but if you even if you uh, don't include them not being on an All NBA team, this team in total has won twelve NBA championships, mm. eight MVP awards, twenty two All NBA def- All Defense, fifty one All NBA appearances. Wow, that's pretty, pretty good. good. Yeah, uh, they better win the gold medal. Oh, if they don't, then it's, imba- well, it's embarrassing. That's the, I mean, you, I, we said earlier about something else. We're here for the story, but again, the story around men's and women's basketball for our nation is uh, if they don't win. Right, it's yeah. fun to watch them, but they all become. I hate to say God, this sounds terrible, and I really don't mean it to sound this way, but they become glorified exhibitions of just, mm-hmm. you know, what America is in basketball. And it's it's fun to see what Spain can do. It's fun to see what France might be able to do. You know, uh, Brazil, perhaps at least from back in the day when Oscar Schmidt played for Brazil, or or like Argentina, but it, Australia, like they'll they'll give you some games. Yeah, Serbia. You know, yeah. Serbia, definitely, man. Um, but they're, if you get upset, it's on you. Mm-hmm. It's not because they're better than you. There is nobody. And, and everybody knows that, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. Darren Fox? Uh, God, don't put Kyrie on the team. Dame? Yeah. There's, that, not, there, there's not one well, player that you'd I did add. Read, like, I did oh read God, on The Athletic. Uh, they'd like Kawhi to be on the team, but Kawhi always a little banged up. Oh yeah. Well, if you can get him for you know five minutes a game and put him in the same lineup as Drew Holiday, no one is scoring for those five minutes. Nobody. Zion ready for the Olympics? Speaking of guys that aren't readily available, banged usually. Up. But it'd be fun. I'd love to see Zion Williamson dunk on somebody kinda, from yeah. the South Sudan that'd be, that'd who they are in a pool with. That'd be kind of cool. Um. Carl Anthony Towns, he's pretty good. Yeah, arguably the greatest three-point shooting big man in the history of the NBA. There are a lot of guys that you could throw in there and it end up, you know, complementing it well. I think Steve Kerr is going to have uh, – they're really the only hard part about Steve Kerr is coming up with lineups and ways to divvy out minutes, which every Olympic coach has had, you know, has had to do. Chuck Daly did a great job with the, the Dream Team, even though it helped that he had two players in Magic and Larry mm-hmm. that – couldn't give you more than 15 minutes in a game, so giving them maybe seven or eight was suitable, or maybe some DNPs in certain instances. You knew Christian Leitner wasn't going to play until the very end, until right. garbage time, so you didn't have to worry about him. So realistically, you had a nine-man rotation yeah. that you were giving double-digit minutes to, so it made it a little easier. Coach K had a, you know, even, I guess, the, what, 2016 Olympics, or uh, whichever one was in London where they completely 12. demolished you, yeah, 12. But they completely demolished everybody, even though Spain gave them a good game in the gold medal game. Yeah, they they that one was a little tougher. Coach, they played they played eleven dudes. Coach K frequently. was was so good at it, man, and and I think that was one of the best parts of those teams when because he coached three Olympics, right? Was mm-hmm. that I mean the respect they had for him and how and you knew like Kobe had talked about it, like he would have played for for Coach K if he played know, in college. Yeah, that he 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 would have gone to Duke, but they were like, "Now, nah, Kobe, you're going to go make a lot of money. You don't need to go to college um and uh but all those guys loved coach k 
and it made it a whole lot easier. Because remember, Beheim was one of his top assistants, and I mm-hmm. think Kerr was Kerr there for a year with him. Or Popovich, I know, was Pop there. was there. Yeah, that's right, Pop. Uh, so there was that NBA presence, but you know, Coach K was there to to guide and 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 lead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, it, just kind of bring it back because oh four, I can't even remember who coached in oh four. I really can't. That was Larry Brown. Oh, well, that sounds about right. I'm like 99 percent sure that one was Larry Brown because they, they, they made Brown some wholesale was the, changes. He was at the hotel bar most of the time. Probably too busy complaining about Allen Iverson. Still, you know, uh, they made some wholesale changes after 04. Well, because it was embarrassing, man. Mm-hmm. It was just embarrassing. You had to get some grown-ups in there, and that that that's all. It just it takes grown-ups sometimes to do grown-up things. Um. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's it's always fun. It, it's 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 fun to see. I I I do love the fact that we see more European guys coming over to America. Not enough from any one nation, I think, to to really push too hard in the medal rounds. But you never know, and you do have to play because though that that's the one thing that I that I think is the saving grace for what we see in the Olympic tournament, Elijah, and that mm-hmm. is that those those are. American players know that the European dudes or the Australian dudes, um, they're they're going to come. They're going to play. The world's catching up. Yeah, they're, they're not. They're not here to go. This isn't. Uh, what was the what's the story like Angola or whatever oh, where Charles that, that Barclay Charles Barkley tells, where he was like, I don't know anything about Angola, but I do know they're in trouble. Right, and he can't do that anymore. But then those dudes were like wanting autographs and pictures, <laughs> man. That was the dream team effect. Yeah, you know, uh, that's not happening now. No. So there, there's, there's that, but, uh, but we'll see. But the, the, that final spot may not be known until after the NBA finals are done and uh, Grant Hill and Steve Kerr assemble their team before they head over to France. All right, we'll stay with some basketball. Could a combined final four be in our future? Some ways to, I'll Ron Burgundy here it again, fix college basketball? We'll discuss as the postgame show continues. The basketball playoffs start this week, tonight actually, with the play-in. A lot of fun action. You can get in on that action with prize picks. It's my favorite fantasy sports app, and it's America's number one fantasy sports app. Get in on the action. You can win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks on prize picks. Turn $10 into 1000 with basketball, hockey, baseball entries. You name it. And plus, prize picks offers injury insurance. So if a player gets hurt in the first half and doesn't come, in the sec- come back in the second half, don't sweat it. They're not going to count it as a loss for you. It's one of the many reasons why I love prize picks. And tonight, I'm going more on Steph Curry three-point projections. It's a five-and-a-half right now. I think he's going to have a big night tonight. So join prize picks and win some money with me. Just download the app today. Use promo code 1075GAME for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. That's code 1075GAME on prize picks for a deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy.
Welcome back into the postgame show on this Tuesday. Jay and Elijah with you. Thank you for being with us. Stuart Lake uh, will join us from the ballpark in Charleston in just a few minutes. Uh, talking Carolina Citadel. That's coming up in just a bit. We'll get him to recap the weekend in Gainesville as well. Kate Crenshaw on the call tonight. Uh, Derek has a, a few things to do. He'll be back on the call this weekend. So Ed Desser, John Costner of the Sports Business Journal, who put out an opinion piece this week on the future of the men's and women's college basketball tournaments. March Madness, as it's called, uh, colloquially. And they've got some things in here that I like, some things in here that I don't. The things that I don't that they propose, I'll start with that, uh, do make sense, but I think would be, uh, I don't know. I, I think it'd be too much change. They say the first two full days of the men's tournament are a national holiday for many sports fans, but who can take Thursday and Friday off? The NBA playoffs start on Saturdays and Sundays, enabling every game to be nationally televised to the biggest possible audience. Open the men's tournament on Saturday and Sunday. Up to eight games per day could be scheduled unopposed. Then use Monday and Tuesday late afternoons and evenings for the second round. We also suggest using home arenas for both tournaments for the first weekend, cutting down on travel, ensuring a great atmosphere for TV, and rewarding the excellent play of higher seeds during the regular season. In theory, all of that makes sense. In practice, I don't want to see any of that. How about no? Right. That's that that, that that's what I think. Yeah. Uh, not even thinking twice about it. Um, all dumb to me. Uh, because you know what makes this tournament so special? The neutral floor environment. I think that might be the worst idea of all. Of yeah. That's the that's the automatic veto. And I think the women are going to that as soon as they can. It may even be, and and I know we discussed this a little bit last week, but we didn't have a lot of time to 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 get in on it. And they haven't had these meetings yet, but. Um, those in charge of women's basketball at the national level uh, have proposed kind of ramping up their their forward thinking meetings on this. They, I think, they would prefer neutral sites to open the tournament. And again, it's because the television value has gone up and the interest in the sport has gone up that it would allow for that. Yeah, way up. That's a great point. Way up. Um, it's done primarily for ticket sales. Yes, it is a mm -hmm. reward, and I got zero problem with that. It is a reward. Cool it reward. is something to play for. Um, I'm, I'm, again, like baseball, I'm here for that. Same thing in baseball, though. I mean, a lot of it is because you will sell tickets, and they'd like to make some money off of these things. Um, Thursday, you know, these guys are right. Thursday and Friday, you're not taking it off. But a lot of people maybe take a few extra hours or something. I, I, I just, nah. Thursday, Friday. And also, I don't know that I really want unopposed time slots. I can't, I don't think I want to watch 14 hours of basketball. No. I mean, I'll hang around. I'll, I'll watch a lot. Don't get me wrong. But I kind of like keeping up, switching mm -hmm. around. And then as, you know, game three in, oh, game four has six minutes left. That's why it's called March Madness. You know, I, so uh, I, I get that. I, I, again, I, I, I applaud their, their effort, but on all of those things, no. No. Well, one, one of the best joys of, uh, of childhood for me was skipping school to watch the first round of the NCAA tournament. It was always funny. I always came down with a mysterious illness in the, uh, in the middle of March on a Thursday and Friday, just enough to keep me out those two days. Wow. I remember, you know, I think our, I think the statute of limitations has passed now, but I definitely called, uh, you know, my high school pretending to be my dad to get my brother out of school after I was out of high school. My brother was still in um, saying that we had a family uh, ordeal and I, you know, I took him out of school and we went uh, and watched March Madness for two straight days. It was fantastic. It's very Ferris Bueller of you. It was. Yeah. It was organized. Or at least, at least. See, a benefit that he had of having an older brother who graduated from the school. Uh -huh. And I can do a good enough impersonation That's of my good. dad to where if they ever sh played him the recording, he might be like, well, you know what? I guess that was me. I guess Cameron actually made the call as Mr. Rooney. But uh, 
nevertheless. Uh, or talk to Mr. Rooney. We can't do that in this format. That's right. I, we, the you know the uh, big brothers of the world can't get their little brothers out of school. Um, one other thing they put is like you know just a couple of things like update the TV schedule uh, to have more primetime games. They might look at that. They might not. I don't know. Like they he, they they make mention the Carolina Iowa game averaged eighteen point seven million the the women's game, and they're like, what if it had been in primetime? That's a fair question. But Sunday at 3 does pretty well. At, at, yeah, and that's Ask why... Ask the NFL if that does pretty right, well. Right, that's why Disney did what it did. I think, let's see how it's doing here. You know, maybe next year it does, but I, I don't know. By Sunday night, maybe it's not as... I don't know. I, I Primetime is overrated. You, I you, think that's a they, pretty fair... They blew it up, man, Yeah. at 3 o'clock on a Sunday. They blew it up. So there's that. Um, so I'm not going to get into too much of those details. Here's the interesting one. Combine the final fours. Uh, they write, uh, Big East Commissioner Val Ackerman outlined this idea in her 2013 white paper, and last month, Casey Wasserman championed it on the Bill Simmons podcast. Currently, the pieces fit and could remain. The women play Friday, Sunday, the men Saturday, Monday. But the NCAA could also create a Super Saturday with all four semifinals and a Monday night championship doubleheader with primetime slots for both. With CBS and Turner, it could also update its sponsor sales approach, permitting de devoted women's championship sponsors to buy standalone packages without buying through the men's overhang. In her white paper, Ackerman wrote that a combined Final Four would, quote, create an unparalleled college basketball showcase that would bring together the best players and coaches in both sports and, importantly, allow the women's tournament to avail itself of the presence of sponsors, media representatives, and important guests who typically bypass the women's final weekend in favor of the men's. The women's leaders aren't in the room where it happens. Another Hamilton reference, uh, they write, uh, the men and women could also play in the same venue, share hotels, etc., and create a basketball Super Bowl. I've said that for years. Uh, the pushback has been from the women's side, from what I have read, that they want a standalone Final Four because they want a showcase, which is perfectly understandable. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know at this point if one, listen, this year, and it may be a bit of a one-off, we'll find out how good the numbers are with star power in the women's game moving forward. Again, we, we saw firsthand here in our community that the Caitlin Clark effect was, was strong. Uh, in, in terms of the numbers. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, she was playing the juggernaut that is South Carolina women's basketball. That helped as well. I Have they gotten, and I'm asking somewhat rhetorically, Elijah, have they gotten to a point now where th they, the women's game, ha ha they've done enough to grow it to where it wouldn't be overshadowed in the same place and could take advantage uh, again that's what i've always said take advantage of all the media and the big wigs that are there mm -hmm. they'll cover you they just can't cover you in two places and you know I'm, i'll just throw out a, a name like pat 40 or you know the, the pat 40s of the world they're going to go to the men's tournament yep you know the michael wilbons are going to the men's tournament um occasionally you might get one to go to the women's tournament this year you had a few more right for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. Nicole Auerbach was at the yeah. women's Final Four this year. I saw uh, a lot of big names. That's, the the, you know, and, and she is big. Uh, I'd, I'd be all for that. A combined weekend of final. I wouldn't do the, the one, you know, Saturday four games and Monday two games, but I'd do Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Got one question. If we're going to do a joint Final Four, are you playing it with the same venue? Uh... Because here's the thing, and this yeah, is I think you, yeah, I th yeah, you play, yeah, you play in the dome. So how are we going to react when the women win, when the women's game ends, and they win a national championship, mm -hmm. and they want to do all the fun stuff that comes with winning a national championship, the mm -hmm. confetti, mm -hmm. cutting down the nets, mm -hmm. a trophy ceremony? Mm -hmm. Are we going to shoo them off to the locker room and do that so we can get the men out there? No, no, no. That's why you don't do it on the same day. I was going to say Friday women. Is that what they're saying? Or I thought well, they, 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 they these guys they said you could do both. They they would they would push more I think for the two days, all of it on Saturday. And all of it on Monday. No, I would not do that. Couldn't do that. that would, see, that's a big thing. Yeah, I would not do that. A Friday night, women's Final Four. Saturday night, men's Final Four. I'd be cool sharing the venue, but doing different days. Yeah, Sunday yeah. afternoon or evening, whatever, women's championship. Monday evening, men's championship. Because my biggest gripe with, with it being the same night is you cannot have it in the same venue. No, the only way you could do that is if you had the women's game, say, tip at like 2 
and the men's game tip at eight if you wanted to do them on the same day. That way there would be zero concern, and you would probably even clear the gym or stadium, as it were. Um, and you might not want to do that either. Yeah, there's a there's a logistical nightmare yeah. with, with doing you're that because you're not doing this in an NBA arena. You're doing this in a football stadium now. I, that's what I would do. I would I, I would have a four day and, and look four days. Get it? Uh, it works. The final four days. Yes. Is the best. I mean, it See, works. Now we man. have a double on time. Yeah, on our hands. It, it, it 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 plays into itself. Um, that that I think should be looked at. And not only that, it would save the NCAA a lot of money, which they would like to do. You know, I mean, it's it really profit. could. Yeah, it, it, and share those profits. But if you're having it all, all your staff instead of two staffs at two places, and now with all the, you know, the, the legitimate gripe that the women's mm-hmm. side had about how poorly they were treated, yep, and you're spending more on them, you know, just go ahead and spend that money in one place. Just about your idea would be better than theirs in well, terms of we, we we could fuse it, you know. That's that's the one thing about the proposal I like. You know, like if we have them in the same uh, location, awesome. I, I think that's good for a lot of for a lot of especially if, if you're a fan of you know UConn or NC State this year where you had your men and women in the Final Four. Yeah. Then you can do it all at the same location. Yeah. And Connecticut. Yeah. yeah you said yeah, you, you yeah, said UConn. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I. Yeah. This. This. That. That would work. It's yeah. more than plausible. Yeah. It's very very doable. But to do a double header at the same venue. No, I wouldn't do that. I would not have a, a quadruple header and a double header. No. I would not do that. I no. think then then I do think the spotlight gets shifted. Yes, and there's because there's too many bells and whistles yeah. that happens after these games to allow for that and for allow it to be done fairly. We'll take a time out here. Stuart Lake on the other side. Coach Lake will join us from Charleston ahead of Carolina and the Citadel. Recap the Gators weekend too. You're listening to the post game show.
From the WIS Traffic Studios, I'm Elijah Campbell. The few accidents to report to you that are causing some delays on the roadways this afternoon. We'll start off with some good news. And that's that an incident has been cleared on I-20 westbound right after the Clemson Road exit, exit 80. So traffic moving a lot more smoothly on 20 west. We still have a couple of other accidents and blockages to report. One on US 378 at US 601 at McCord's Ferry Road. We also have another accident in Lexington County on Pilgrim Church Road at Catawba Trail. And lastly, we have an object on the roadway that's causing some mild traffic back up over on I-26 eastbound. That's going to be over at I-20 exit, exit 107B. We're going to spend a few minutes talking Carolina baseball. The team back at it tonight down in Charleston. This is typically when Derek Scott joins us. He's unavailable. So Stuart Lake, kind enough, as I said, using a baseball term to pinch hit for the voice of the Gamecocks this afternoon. And uh, Cade Crenshaw will be on the play-by-play with Stuart tonight as the Gamecocks take on the Citadel. Coach, appreciate you. you you're, this is, uh, what, twice in the last three shows that you've been with us. So, uh uh, always uh, great to have you. How are things in beautiful Charleston, South Carolina this afternoon? Uh, doing great. I came down early today, got to see a bunch of our donors, and uh, and I'm a little superstitious too, so since we're, you know, undefeated since the last time I spoke to you, when you <laughs> asked, I was going to jump right back on. <laughs> uh, yeah, good stuff. Let's let's start with something that, that really did work well this weekend, Coach, and that, that was seeing Will Tippett uh, not, not go to the switch hitting, uh, s- exclusively to the right side, four hits, got a couple of walks, Seems like there's a little confidence it may be back. And, and Mark told us yesterday uh, they feel like that's going to hang around for a little bit. What did you see in Will's approach that gives you some some good vibes moving forward? Yeah, I was listening to you guys yesterday. I was proud of you getting your gold star, noticing <laughs> that he hadn't switched it all weekend. So, But, you know, <laughs> Coach said the main thing, and I'll be honest with you, Jay, I haven't – Usually you don't find me switch hitters that are right-handed hitters. Right. Typically when you're a right-handed hitter, you just, you've just you grown up seeing right-handed pitching and left-handed pitching obviously helps you. So when they started the discussion of maybe letting him go back to that natural side, which was righty, I thought that was probably a good idea in a sense that he'd be more comfortable. And then this weekend, I mean, guy hit 400 this weekend. And the factor is he became, and as you all talked about yesterday, offensively you could see his confidence growing throughout the weekend so i hope he can continue that tonight because he really became a big part leading to the top of our order getting some rbi opportunities with him and different guys and you mentioned the top of the order there's a little bit of another change too that uh, definitely caught my eye and i thought was it was very interesting and when i was dying to ask mark about yesterday was cole messina hitting leadoff and he mentioned you know he wanted to stagger the lineup to where you know it's you know left right left right and, and really mm-hmm. give you know the opposing pitching staff um, something di- something different to look at, but what impact did you see when uh, Cole's moved to be the leadoff hitter? That uh, what did you see? I guess in terms of the impact on the lineup that it had. Well, Cole Messina and, and I told a few people he's a lot like Eli Jones. They want to set the tone for the weekend. That's why when Eli was talking about y'all are not think about not throwing me on a short week, I'm throwing the first game. He told me that the next day in the locker room. He said, "Oh no, I start the weekends." Cole wants to be the guy to set the tone. And what's the good thing when you can't put a Cole Messina in that leadoff spot is you got a legitimate power guy. And as much as I joke about him because I've known him forever, he really has been running the bases very well. He scored from first now five times. I got to run and count with him in games. And that's not easy to say you scored from first base on hit. He stole a few bases, but he just brings an attitude to the top of that lineup. I love Parker Nolan hitting second. I've always loved left-handed hitters hitting second. I really feel we're starting to kind of create – I think Coach Kingston probably knows his nine guys right now, barring any injuries. He's still kind of tinkering with the batting order. But, shoot, I'm 
I'm not messing with much after some of the stuff I saw this weekend. And on that note, Stuart, Mark told us yesterday, right, left, right, left, right, left. They're all, all down. Uh, you, you've, you've been in this game. You've coached this game at multiple levels through your career. You analyze it now. Get, take us more from an opponent's point of view of, of what that feels like going against. Well, when we were staggering our hitters together or clustering them together, as a coach, you start thinking, okay, I, I can run the lefty in here to face three lefties. Or if I run the lefty in, they're going to have to pinch hit probably because they don't want to do three lefties. So a lot of times you feel like as a coach, you can dictate their batting order by your pitching. But when it's right, left, right, and I saw Sully a few times really kind of wavering. Do I take the righty out now because there's a righty coming up? Do I take the lefty out now? So I, Coach Kingston, I used to talk about a lot. If you can go right, left, right, or left, right all the way through, I love it because it just never clusters your guys and never makes it an easy choice for the opponent pitchers. And I uh, believe Tyler Pitzer's on the mound tonight. You know, Saturday he came in in relief and got the save in, in a pretty tight spot. Two strikeouts, one walk in the inning, but was able to get the save and fight off, you know, Florida's push. Where do you see him fitting in? You know, because he's, he's pitched well at different roles this season, whether it be coming in to close the game on Saturday or in the Vanderbilt series, getting the start on Sunday and shutting down a really good Vanderbilt lineup. What have you seen from him, and where do you think maybe he fits best in terms of trying to assign a role to a pitcher like that? Well, I'm kind of torn because I know what I did against Vanderbilt. The A&M team is last start. That's a really good offensive team. So I try not to over-evaluate. But I was telling Cade this story on the way down here. Derek typically will say, who do we think is our player of the game? Well, Saturday, I just got up and was ready to walk out. He goes, whoa, 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 who's our player of the game? And I said, Pitzer's our player of the game. He just got to save in Florida and won a series. There ain't nobody else I wanted to go down there and talk to. So I really liked as soon as he came in, and this is something that's important to me as a coach, he had his breaking ball from warm-ups on. And that's a big deal because the first thing when a young pitcher shows you he's nervous is he can't throw his breaking ball for strikes. And it starts in warm-ups. I always paid attention. If a young reliever came in, you'll notice they all they really want to do is throw that fastball. When the SEC, you can't win with your, just your fastball. And, but when I noticed him come in, I said it to Derek before the ninth started. I said, dude, he's throwing his breaking ball really well. And that was a huge part of that ninth inning to get out of it. Florida had all the momentum. They had just gotten back in that thing, and they were cornered. And to, for him to do that, I really – all that means, I want to see how he does tonight, but he's a dude that I'm going to have ready to go for me late in the game every weekend because he showed him tremendous composure this weekend. Talking to Stuart Lake ahead of Carolina and the Citadel. Uh, one more offensive question for you. Dalton Reeves, uh, like he's, he spelled Cole a few times behind the plate, but uh, DHing this weekend uh, with uh, homers on Saturday and on Sunday. Veteran presence really making himself known right now and, and, and maybe hard for, for anybody to pull him out of this lineup. Yeah, I, honestly, I can wouldn't be shocked to see him move up in the lineup. In fact, because the way he handled left-handed pitching and Florida had some some really good left-handed pitching and he has just really Dalton looks like a you know that fifth year guy he's a grad student he had already got his degree at PC now he's getting his graduate degree and Cade who always does great research this is the first night tonight because we're assuming Dalton's gonna be in lineup mm. this is gonna be the first night Dalton and Sawyer's brother who's like second on the lead, on the team for Citadel hitting, are going to play in the same game in college. So oh. pretty cool night for the Reese family. Yeah, that is a big deal. That's that's good yeah. stuff. Uh, and, and the importance of these midweek games now, Stuart, uh, you know, from your perspective, do they become enhanced? I mean, can you, you know, you, you want to host and, and you've got opportunities. The RBI is still strong. W what are the conversations like around these kinds of games? Well, these kind of games are on your chase to 30. So now when you start looking at RPI and you start looking at rankings, you then start looking at wins. You know, A&M's already at 30. Arkansas's at 30. I think Kentucky got 30 this weekend. So as you're starting now to think about your resume, it's important to get all these midweeks. I know we got this one here. Uh, we go to Winthrop and then have one more home midweek with East Tennessee State. It's really crucial to get all these because this is going to help you as you go, not only just the 30, as you try to get to then 35, there's certain numbers that really, when they sit around in that room trying to pick teams for regionals, and I was fortunate enough to, to be in there a lot when I represented the Big South, 
those numbers are talked about. Hey, they got 38 wins. Hey, they had 40 wins. Hey, they only had 31 wins. So these are those numbers that really do add up here in the next month. Coach, appreciate you on short notice. Uh, Y'all have a great call tonight, you and Cade, and we will talk to you again here real soon. Yes, sir. Thank y'all. Enjoyed it. You bet. That is Stuart Lake, Stuart underscore Lake, if you want to follow Coach on Twitter. Uh, 645 tonight, 7 o'clock, first pitch. And it's, again, Tyler Pitzer going for Carolina. Uh, four and one with a 312, 26 innings pitch, 38 strikeouts already, just 12 walks. Uh, Connor Comiskey going for the Citadel, two and three with a 764, 17 and two thirds, 18 strikeouts, 18 walks. Ooh, not a good ratio. Might want to get after it. Uh, we'll see what happens. That one again starts tonight uh, at seven o'clock down in Charleston. All right, if you would like to go see Carolina and Arkansas on Sunday afternoon, be caller 5 right now to 803-404-6100. 803-404-6100. Caller 5, you get a pair, Carolina and Arkansas. And I'll come back and tell you why maybe politicians shouldn't pressure coaches for the Olympics. I'll explain.
Welcome back into the post game show. <coughs> Excuse me, post game show on this Tuesday. I'm good. Rest in peace. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know where that came from. That was out of nowhere. I promise I didn't go outside smoking heaters while I was uh, in the commercial break. <laughs> as far as you know. I was going to say, if, if you did, you did it in here because you did not leave the studio. So. And if you're able to do that without setting off any smoke detectors, yeah, no, no, uh, then you have a talent. No, didn't didn't do that. Sorry. Uh, real quick before I get into that Olympic story and the politicians uh, that go along with it. Uh, just announced uh, earlier today, CBS had its least watched final round of the Masters in the last four years. Uh, the average of 9.6 million was down 21% from last year. Uh, it did peak on Sunday at 12 million. Uh, it is, let me see here, the third, if you want to say worst, uh, third lowest is probably the better way to say it. Third lowest Sunday viewership since 1997. All have come since COVID. Wow. Well, you do like lower scores in golf, so maybe it's a good thing. And no. Just kidding. Uh, and you know who won in 2019? Tiger Woods. Ah. You know who's not playing as well anymore on Saturdays and Sundays? El Tigre. It, it, there's a direct correlation. Yeah. Definitely. There's no, I mean, there's no question. I mean, at his, at the, at the height of his powers for, for a good decade, decade and a half, when he played some, the numbers were often double the typical numbers. And this is not just for majors. This could be, you know, at, at Bay Hill or out at Riviera. The waste management. You know, yeah. Or up in Charlotte, even when he played there a few times. Um, so it's uh I don't think he I don't know if he played that one to be honest with you Phoenix he might have a couple of times early I think I think he knew enough to stay away from that one the but, party was a little too much yeah because by then he had played Pebble Beach and he had played Riviera and all those and it's probably anyway um man yeah. last year 12 million this year nine again a little about 9.6 average I think the tiger effect or lack thereof is is the main reason why so and i don't know if golf can do anything about that no you he's a i'm not, not sure he's just a generational star he really does kind of stand alone jack nicholas and arnold palmer were very big deals but you know, until someone else comes along that can capture the imagination the way tiger did i just think that's part of it man well you know what the best news for golf is Tiger's son's pretty good. Yeah. And he's getting older. He's yeah. playing golf himself. Charlie. And, he's doing, and Charlie's doing pretty well. Yeah. I guarantee you when Charlie gets to play in his first Masters, ratings bump. <sighs> yeah, but the boy. We'll all oh feel my. very old. God, the pressure. Ugh, ugh. I, I don't want that for that kid, man. I love seeing the videos of him it's lining great. up putts yeah. and doing all, having all the yeah. exact same mannerisms as, as his dad. Yeah. I just, That's a lot of pressure. If, if he could be if he could be 75% of his dad, he's going to be tremendous. If he could be 50% of his dad, he's going to be Shoot, fantastic. 25 could get him a major. Yeah, get him <laughs> four. Goodness. Uh, the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, this week has uh, pressured, he says, European clubs to release their players for the Olympics uh, this summer, which will be in France, in Paris. Uh, I'll, I'll let all of you know, the Olympic soccer tournament, while an official tournament, does not fall into the typical class of international calendars. Uh, and it is also an under-23 tournament, meaning you, you're, the bulk of your players must be 23 or under to be on the roster. FIFA allows three senior players, they call them, to be included on national teams for the Olympics. FIFA doesn't want the Olympics to uh, have any interference with the World Cup. I don't blame them. In fact, right. I think the women should do the same now that the women's gr game has grown to a point mm -hmm. where it is very respectable. Uh, they should also, in my opinion, go to an under-23. But Kylian Mbappe, many of you have heard that name, even if you don't follow soccer. Kylian Mbappe is currently the best player on the planet. He's French. He's won the World Cup, and he's lost a World Cup final. Uh, he currently plays for Paris, but this summer it is uh, widely expected that he is going to Real Madrid, the biggest club on the planet, and that he's probably going to make about a million dollars a week while he's there. Uh, he's going to play for France in the European Championships, which are a bigger deal than the Olympics. But the French president says, no, no, no. 
let him leave let him go listen real madrid should not in my opinion i know if, if they can find a way great but for some other players of his ilk if you're playing in the european championships coming off a a, a grind of a season and they're getting ready to invest a million bucks a week in you if not more he needs a break because they don't want to play the first month of the season or more without him it's not what you're paying him for yeah but the pressure from the president could be strong but maybe not that strong. Money is probably going to win this one. We shall see. Headlines and Shane Beamer comments coming up. Hey, I love telling you about our good friends at Kato's Power Equipment. I tell you a lot about my Toro Time Master, but I want to tell you as well that Ben and Matt and the crew have a lot of things, especially for you guys that do this for a living. There's a lot of equipment rental. Now, listen, you could be doing it for yourself. Maybe you need something really big done once at your house. Maybe you need to aerate the lawn, things like that. They're, they're renting those kind of things. They're also renting battery-operated equipment. Maybe it's something that you're interested in. Get a feel for what's going on. Less stuff to break and be repaired, uh, as Ben tells me. Stop into Kato's and see that. And again, all the other power, not just mowers, right? I mean, trimmers, edgers, chainsaws, reciprocating saws, whatever you might need. Riders, walk-behinds, they've got it all for you. And again, a fantastic service department. So whether you're cutting your own backyard or doing it for a living, see Kato's for excellent sales, service, and advice. Family-owned since 1983, historically located at 4012 West Beltline Boulevard and always online at katospowerequipment.com. From the WIS Traffic Studios, I'm Elijah Campbell with a couple accidents to report to you that are causing some delays on the roadways this afternoon. We'll start in Richland County where an object on the roadway on I-26 eastbound is causing some traffic back up over at the I-20 exit, exit 107B, so traffic moving pretty slowly through there. We also have a couple of others in the county on Monticello Road at I-20 and another one on US-378 at US-601 near McCord's Ferry Road. In Lexington County, we have two to report to you. One on Pilgrim Church Road at Catawba Trail. That one's been causing some issues for about the last 30 minutes or so. And lastly, we have one at Mineral Springs Road near Laurel Road.
And welcome back in to the final hour of the postgame show as well. Jay Phillips, Elijah Campbell with you. We'll start our integrated media headlines with Carolina baseball. The Gamecocks at the Citadel tonight. Tyler Pitzer is on the hill for Mark Kingston's club. The freshman righty, 4-1 and one on the year with a 312 ERA. 26 innings pitch, 38 strikeouts to just 12 walks. He goes against the Citadel's Connor Comiskey, a senior righty who is struggling this season. Two and three, a 7-6-4 ERA and 17 and two-thirds, uh, 18 walks and 18 strikeouts, 645 airtime across the Gamecock Radio Network tonight and a 7 o'clock first pitch. Uh, the Citadel 16 and 18 overall on the season, South Carolina looking for its 29th win of the year. And uh, after that, Carolina opens a seven-game homestand. Arkansas, Winthrop, and Kentucky all coming to town. Two best teams in the SEC. Big stretch. Big stretch. Congratulations to Camilla Cardoso. The Gamecock Center was drafted third last night by the Chicago Sky. The only Gamecock taken, if I'm not mistaken, the only Gamecock basically available to be drafted last night, right? Unless somebody wanted to take Sakima Walker. Yeah. She was the only one that I think that's not going to be coming back next year because she has run out of eligibility. Yeah. Uh, and may have her opportunities elsewhere. We'll we'll see about that. But uh, Camilla yeah. will be joined on her roster by Angel Reese. And uh, earlier today, I uh, asked Elijah, somewhat rhetorically, it's going to be okay, right? With I wonder what the conversations emoji? in you know, the pre-draft interviews will, will, uh, was like with someone like Angel Reese. Because Angel got picked second, right? Or, uh, by, second by the team. She's yeah, seventh by the team. overall, yeah, second seven, by the team. Right. So they knew they were going to get Camilla first. They're eyeballing Camilla. I think you know the, the orders one, two, and three are pretty set coming into the draft. There right. were no surprises there. So I had to wonder in the pre-draft interview part of the the process they ask angel reese hey we're thinking about taking camilla cardoso can we be chill can we take it easy for a little bit <laughs> can, can we promise because we would like to have a twin a twin tower situation down on the low block would we be able to uh to put the past behind us i, I mean i want to think the answer is yes Look, I'm not trying to keep it going, and you're not either. No. But what we talked about was was real. We're that, not going to ignore the elephant that, in the room. That SEC championship game was one, one for the ages in terms of 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 a lot of things that happened. It's it. There are there are multiple images that we will remember. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a couple of them involved Camilla, and and one of those that involved Camilla absolutely involved Angel Reese. And it wasn't good. No, it wasn't good. Some cheap fouls, some called, some not. Um, some ve- some very intense trash talk, pulling of the hair, and not getting called for that. And yeah, you that know, one was wild. Camilla shrugging it off, and just like you know, anything. You know, look, Angel Reese has her championship. I, I I grant you that she has her national title. They didn't have to go through South Carolina directly for that one. Um. You know, Camilla's got two national championships, and she won that SEC championship. So there's that. So it could just be that it is all water under the bridge. I, they're, they're not going to be the first professional athletes to be paired together who didn't like each other as collegiate athletes. Hey, the 1980 U.S. men's Olympic hockey team, the one, the uh, Do You Believe in Miracles team, was made up of a bunch of players who had to play against each other in a college championship where a brawl broke out yeah. that ultimately, you know, was the story of those entire cha- that entire championship game, and they fought in practice because it's very well documented. They, think, none of those guys liked each other going into it, but they I, put it behind them and made history. I think Herb did that on purpose, man. I think so. Yeah, I think he I think he used every bit of I don't know if negative energy is what I'm going for, but for lack of a better term, Herb had a sense of knowing how to harness. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the, I think it will be. I, but that's why I ask yeah. somewhat with the shrug, it'll be okay, right? I do like what Camilla's answer was because someone did ask at the press conference last night if, you know, there was uh, what she thinks about pairing up with, with Angel Reese, and she said no one's going to get any rebounds against us. There you go. Good answer. Yeah. You're pros Which now. is true. Which is true. If yeah. they're in the same lineup, good luck. Yeah. They're going to grab a lot of boards. Uh, Caitlin Clark went first overall. She will be going to the Indiana Fever, where last year Carolina's Aaliyah Boston was the number one overall pick. So you, you got to think by uh, virtue of those two number ones, since they had the number one again, 
uh, you know, now you start to see Indiana get it back a little bit. Oh, and they're getting Katie Lou Samuelson back, former UConn legend. Yeah. She missed all of last year because of the birth of a child. So there was uh, they were they were missing some pieces. So now you're going to have, and I, I don't think Katie, Katie Lou is number one, but yeah. she was a a first round pick. Uh-huh. So those are three of some of the best women's college basketball players of an entire era teaming up to play for the Indiana Fever. So they really, I don't say they tanked, but circumstances happened to fall in their favor to where they were to acquire all these you know, pieces of talent to where now. Just, I just a see rebuild. This, it's a slow it, it's rebuilding a slow mode. Rebuild. Yes, yeah. this is not quite Sam Hinkie in the process. Right. But they're now in a position after, you know, having the worst record last season to where they, um, I did see on SportsCenter, their over-under, their Vegas over-under uh, in terms of wins is what their, I guess, franchise record would be. Wow. Which is? I believe it was 24 and a half. And you said a 40-game regular season, right? Yeah. All right, pretty good. We'll I'll double see. check that. But they did say, they did say it would be, it would be a record if they were to hit that over. Uh, switching gears now, going to uh, Hilton Head, where uh, actually yours truly will be broadcasting from Harbor Town the next couple of days. Looking forward to that. Rory McElroy down there today. Of course, this is now uh, the Heritage is one of the signature events on the PGA Tour, and uh, Rory is down there. Was asked today about a major rumor in a London newspaper that said he had been, and they they said they had sourced information that he had been offered. Eight hundred fifty million dollars and a two percent equity stake in Live Golf if he would come over. Rory said today that neither he nor his agents have ever discussed a potential deal to go to Live Golf. Quote, I honestly don't know how these things get started. I've never been offered a number from Live, and I've never contemplated going to Live. Again, I think I've made it clear over the past two years, I don't think it's something for me. It doesn't mean that I judge the people who went and played over there. I think one of the things that I've realized over the past two years is that people can make their own decisions for whatever they think is best for themselves, and who are we to judge them for that? But personally, for me, my future is here on the PGA Tour, and it's never been any different. Uh, already a 24-time winner. Uh, he is uh, going to be playing in Hilton Head this weekend. Everybody's scheduled. for This is pretty much a full field event. Scotty Scheffler is even uh, still on the schedule. No report yet on Mrs. Scheffler having that baby that was making news this weekend. Could have made really big news. Whether Scotty was going to leave Augusta to go be there for the birth of his first child. So uh, we shall see. But uh, looking forward to it. And I'll have some uh, things for you for the next couple of days from the beautiful Harbor Town Golf Links, where I see it's going to be about 10 degrees cooler. Oh, yes. Than it will be here. Yes. Yeah. That's the sweet spot right there. So, what, 60 degrees? Uh, I think the highs uh, are eight, around 80. Highs around 80. High, maybe high 70s. Yeah. But up here, I think Thursday it's going to be like 91, 92. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's aggressive. Well, I didn't do it. I was just telling you what they what they said. The sun's undefeated, man, like we've mentioned before. I, I can try my best. I ain't stopping it. Michigan football has uh, been placed on three years probation. Uh, they will pay a fine. Don't know how much yet. And they face some recruiting restrictions. This after the university and five current or former football coaches slash employees reached agreement with the NCAA on uh, several recruiting violations. The agreed-upon penalties also include one-year show cause orders for the participating individuals. The portion of the case that involves Jim Harbaugh will be considered separately by the committee. Then it will determine its full decision according to the release this morning from the NCAA, uh, Coach Harbaugh's attorney, Tom Mars, uh, has spoken today, says neither he nor Harbaugh knew about the agreement to the case until seeing it today. Uh, Mr. Mars doesn't know whether Harbaugh would have participated because they were unaware about the discussions to resolve the case. <laughs> I Man... I love Jim Harbaugh. I am such a Jim Harbaugh fan as a coach. I truly, truly am. Oh, I didn't know they were doing it. Come on, man. Come on, man. 
This man put on master class of I mean, denial. It's just, it's just amazing. Dude, you know, I'm going to go so far as, as to say, you know what? Maybe Jim Harbaugh is so cloaked in Harbaugh land. Maybe he didn't. It's like, well, he knew they would be doing it. Right? Like, but come on, Jim. That's the, that's the charm about Jim Harbaugh is that, you know, there are not many other coaches where you would believe that about them. Like, Jim Harbaugh looks like he lives in his own planet. Oh, he does. There's no, 99%. There's no question. He is so quirky yeah. and just so weird. And the amount of, of Harbaugh stories that have come out of Ann Arbor over the last decade, you know, range from just odd to fanatical. But to the point where, I, you know what, it makes me, like, consider – you know, maybe he didn't have any idea, which does what, Jay? It casts a shadow of a doubt, which in a court of law, it's pretty good yeah. at quitting you of things. Uh, but I guess in public opinion, it, it can do so, too, for a good chunk of the population. I, I Like us. Yeah. I, I, I find it difficult. But, again, he does. He, he's I, I get it. Like and Rick he, Pitino? Not buying it. Right. Wouldn't buy it. Right. At all. Right. This guy? I may. A little. I may. A I little may. bit. Um. A lot of this has to do with the COVID-19 dead period uh, violations. Uh, also, Jim Harbaugh knowingly had uh, analysts that are not allowed to be in practice on the field, at practice and on the field. He had some analysts at other fields. Here and Michigan, ba- yeah, Michigan uh, basically admitted, yeah, we weren't, we weren't monitoring any of that because it was Jim's team. That's what they basically said. I mean, they, they did. They basically they admitted, yeah, we we we. Whatever Jim wanted is what we did for football. Because that's what Jim said. Which, and, it, and it ended up it ended up working. Which means, you know what the best job in America would have been? Across any field, any department, being the compliance, uh, the compliance director at Michigan would have been the easiest job on the planet. You don't have to show up. Yeah, just have dude, the title. Some dude in a deck chair. <laughs> Locked out. in his office, you know, watching Friends reruns sure. or whatever it is that they were doing because they surely weren't checking anything. But they, so, I yeah, mean, that they, was the, – that's the job. That's the dream yeah. job right there because you know you're making decent money. You're probably not making bank. But you know what? You are just – you're getting paid to live. Not a bad gig. Now things are changed. Now you're in NCAA trouble. Now you kind of have to do your job. But for a couple of years – Got to be really peachy in that if, office. If they go after Jim, I mean, again, what, what are they going to do if he doesn't come back to college? They, got, they can pop Michigan for something. And you and I mentioned this earlier this afternoon when we were talking about it. You know, th- this committee is going to want someone else's head to roll. Uh, I hate for it to be Sharon Moore. I don't think it would be. They can't really do anything to him directly. Just I, is it a, is it a heavier fine for Michigan? Is it more probation for Michigan? Is it a loss of scholarships for Michigan? Some combination? I don't know. But they're going to find Jim Harbaugh, you know, I'm going to say it here, guilty of, you know, the things that head coaches are supposed to be responsible for and then not caring. Because, again, Jim didn't care. No. And Michigan didn't look after it. But they won the title. So They that- put all their eggs in that basket to have him leave. Uh, finally, for you, our integrated media headlines of the day, the Atlanta Braves have announced today that Ozzie Albies will be going on the 10-day uh, injured list last night uh, in the second inning. If you all were watching, Ozzie got uh, hit on the foot, and he fractured his big toe on his right foot. So hopefully the 10 days will be enough. It's just a fracture, not broken, they say. But he continued to play last night in some pain, and today I imagine he woke up and went, man, my toe is twice as big as it's supposed to be. It is supposed to look like that. Yeah, yeah this ain't right. This hurts. Right. So Ozzy will go on the 10-day IL. David Fletcher has been called up from Gwinnett to take his place on the roster. Braves beat the Astros last night 6-1. to one. They will be in Houston again tonight. That's the Integrated Media headlines of the day brought to you by Integrated Media. Whether it's installing your new video doorbell, moving TVs around the house, installing a complete security or home theater system, all of the above and more, Integrated Media makes it happen. No job too big, no job too small for Integrated Media. Remember that. 803-948-8327. More affordable than you think when you use the guys at Integrated Media. Shane Beamer comments coming up.
Welcome back into the post game show on this Tuesday. Jay and Elijah with you. Appreciate you being with us. Still to come this hour, drive around the SEC and one more opportunity to win tickets to Carolina, Arkansas, Sunday afternoon series finale at Founders Park. That'll be coming up for you before we leave the air. Again, Carolina baseball tonight uh, at 6.45 on uh, 107.5 The Game and the Gamecock Radio Network. Uh, the Gamecocks at the Citadel. Do want to remind you real quick, too, that our craft beer card is back. You can spend $30 per brewery at 12 different craft beer locations across the Midlands. That's a $360 value. You only pay $79. That's good math. Go to 1075thegame.com and click on Terry Ford's clicky, spinny thingy that says sweet deals. That he built with his bare hands. Yep. The clicky, spinny thingy. There you go. Good luck. When I say not good luck for that one, you have to buy that one. So you, you don't need luck. Well, I hope you have the money in your account. Yes. And if it's questionable that you have it or not, and you're just going to put in a number anyway, then yes, good luck. I do I do bid you the best of luck to get that beer card. Sorry, I still have the tickets on my mind. <laughs> best of luck. Good luck. With, good luck managing. Like for- Listen, if you're like me, then you need, regardless, good luck managing your personal funds. Hey, I, I was told good luck whenever I received the beer card with a week before it expired. Sure. So I, w- I was told good luck in regards to getting this beer card before. So you would not be the first person to wish somebody luck uh, with our craft beer card. Sure. Or the last. Enjoy. Cheers. How's that? Many times over. Uh, you may be saying cheers to one another on Saturday at the spring game. Shane Beamer will be working, but he may have a cold one afterwards. You never know. Uh, coach was asked today as he has his final press conference ahead of the spring game. How much stock do you actually put in this particular contest? Yeah, I'd say it's a combination of both. I'm not one of those guys, Mike, that looks at the spring game and say it doesn't matter because it does. It's another opportunity to go on the field and compete. It's an opportunity to get better. And some guys, frankly, they step up when the lights come on, if you will, and they're gamers. So there's a 14 practice body of work that obviously we put a whole lot of weight on, but we're not one of those people that just say, hey, let's just throw something out there entertaining and 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 go home. I mean, we're we're competing and <clears throat> they, we want to win those each particular team does. And I like I think there's something to the fact that when there's people in the crowd, the lights are on, it's on television that some guys step up and elevate their games and really you notice them and some guys you hopefully don't but some guys maybe go the other direction so i think it's a great indicator and it's so important because as you guys have heard me say before we don't get a preseason game in college football and we don't get a scrimmage against another team so for a lot of these guys it'll be the biggest crowd they've ever played in maybe and for a lot for all of them it'll be the biggest crowd we play in front of until we do it for real against old dominion in august so it's a great barometer for individuals and how they perform in those situations without a doubt I it, it does matter, and I'm glad he brought it up because about halfway through that, I was thinking, you know what I'm going to say here, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll just back it up. It, it's You need to make this. It's time to take these FCS games off the regular season schedule and make them spring games, not just here in South Carolina for the Gamecocks and the Tigers, across the country, a- across the country. That way you can share the wealth, which – so many people are concerned about and i appreciate mm-hmm. you can have a game where you can evaluate your your team a little bit better because they're playing somebody else um there's always a risk of injury but other you know but he's right though in a in a in a, in a sense to come back around to a, uh, what is an exhibition game you know a scrimmage uh he's right um this will have some guys maybe turn it up a notch or two and if they don't you know that too so there's 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 both ways to weigh it, but I would so much rather see college football uh, evolve into having these spring games be against FCS, comp- at least at this level, yeah. uh, be against FCS teams and and see what you got. And even for our jobs, like we, I, I would like to watch a spring game and learn something. Yeah. Right. There's so many spring games that I watch when preparing for the football season where I'm trying to figure out, you know, at least how a guy, like how a guy looks in an offense or how, you know, you get some type of clue of how certain players are going to be used. And I hate watching something and being like, I learned absolutely nothing from that. Right. And poor Phil Steele, man. 
That guy, who is the best in the world <laughs> yes. at getting people like us ready for the college football season, has been tweeting about every spring game that he watched. And I, I feel for him that he sat through the entire Ole Miss, uh, I guess, you know, what, whatever that thing was at Ole Miss, the flag football game, the whatever it is, the Joey Chestnut hot dog eating contest. Poor Phil's trying to learn. Poor Phil's trying to learn something about college football. And all Lane Kiffin did was give him an hour and a half infomercial of how good his players look in shorts and T-shirts. Yep. I feel bad for Phil. That stinks. But you know what? A spring game would actually get Phil and us to learn a little something. Yeah, something. The fans will learn a little something about these teams. Not exactly how they compete against Joey Chestnut when it, ter- when it comes in terms of how many hot dogs you can eat in a small amount of time. Because, you know, spoiler, they're not beating them. No one is. Right. No one on the planet's beating them. Right. So I don't have to tell you to go watch to see what the result is. You already know. So it'd be nice to be able to have something where we learned a little something about these players and teams. I agree. hundred percent. We'll see. Maybe one day. But uh, poor Phil. Then again, maybe not. Shane was also asked today how he and Dow Loggins uh, look at, uh, you know, the the art, if you will, perhaps of deciding who plays quarterback. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, I think certainly, just like to Mike's question, guys, whether it be quarterbacks or <clears throat> other positions, they can they have the ability when the lights come on to really step up and, and show, you know what, this guy's a gamer. And uh, the quarterback position is no different. Obviously, we've been evaluating everything every single day since we started practice in March as well. Uh, as far as naming one and where we are, you know, we whatever we do, our players know that competition is a core value, so we will continue to compete at every single position through the summertime, through the uh, month of August preseason camp. You know, we got guys that are returning starters like Debo Williams, but Debo knows he has to compete every day to continue to be the starting linebacker here at South Carolina. Nicky, e. man, worry, Nicky Smith, whoever, Tonka, TJ. <clears throat> um, but I think there's different philosophies. You know, I've been in those situations before where you have a quarterback battle and. Um, I mean, we were, I had one at Oklahoma my first year there with a young man by the name of Austin Kendall and a guy that ended up being a pretty good quarterback by the name of Kyler Murray. And we had a quarterback battle that literally went until the middle of August as well. And Lincoln did not name a starting quarterback. I've been a part of other places where you name the starting quarterback because you want to have your team be able to rally around that guy kind of in the summertime where they know, okay, he's the guy going into the season and we need to rally around him. So I think each situation is different. I think both of those philosophies are valid and it's just kind of depends on each situation and where we are. Dow and I haven't talked about it as far as our time frame and wanting to do anything. But like I said, even if there was some sort of announcement after spring practice, like all positions, that position has to continue to prove it and earn it and compete. So there you go. Um, it's 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 interesting to me. I'm not trying to to create any controversy or stir the pot here. It's just as I observe these things, you know, we go from mm, middle of December when Shane Beamer was on this radio program with Elijah and me. You know, we're we're ready to go, but we do need with 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 Lenoris, but we do need somebody else in the room and we will go get someone else in the room and we want that person to be the best possible quarterback he can be and they end up getting Robbie Ashford who's played at Oregon and Auburn. Flash forward to now and I'm not saying that there's any difference per se in the back of his mind, middle of his mind, front of his mind, but I can't get in between his mind. I hear what he says and now, hey, I'm not sure that we have a timeline on when I'm going to tell you who the number one quarterback is. It's just interesting that that's part of the process. You know, is Lenora still number one? If you ask me, I'm going to say yes. But when the coach gets asked, I don't know. And here's the thing, too. I'll tell you later. I think the the example that he alluded to with Kyler Murray, you know, not being announced until mid-August that he was going to be the starter, I think they knew. For a, you probably have a, a good idea, right? But there's some merit to to keeping the information private. There's some advantage to keeping the information private. But I don't know. That's a uh, he did see. He cited a couple of examples of different schools of thought in terms of keeping that close to the chest. I I, I think we probably won't know until mid August as well. Right. I, I'm I'm leaning towards that first example that uh, he had from Oklahoma. More from Shane on how they pick rosters for the spring game and a portal activity question we'll get to from Coach. That's all part of the drive around the SEC, which is next.
From the WIS Traffic Studios, I'm Elijah Campbell with a couple of accidents to report to you that are causing some delays on the roadways this afternoon. We'll start here in Richland County. An accident on Gervais Street at Hugie Street is causing some traffic back up here downtown. We also got one on I-20 westbound just after the Fairfield Road exit, exit 70. That is causing some decent traffic back up, as well as another on I-126 westbound at I-26 and on Monticello Road at I-20. In Lexington County, we have two accidents to report. We'll start with one at Cox Ferry Road near US-1. And lastly, we have one that has just popped up, an accident at Mineral Springs Road near Laurel Road. It is drive around the SEC time. Lots of transfer news to get to. Let's jump right in. Jay Phillips, Elijah Campbell with you on this Tuesday. Texas A&M safety Jacoby Matthews is in the portal. He is the 17th player to enter the portal since Mike Elko became uh, the new head coach uh, down in College Station. I, I, don't, I don't read too much into that other than just kids went to play for Jimbo. Now they want to go play somewhere else. Um, he was a... Uh, a three, ESPN 300 prospect in the 2022 class. He's from Louisiana, played in 11 games last season, 42 tackles, one interception, four PPUs. Uh, Coach Elko trying to keep a lot of these guys. Again, Jimbo recruited at a high level, and they just don't win at a high level. And I'll remind you, uh, for players that enter the portal in the Southeastern Conference in the spring window, they can't transfer to another Southeastern Conference school. So, uh, you know, Jacoby will not be headed to, say, LSU. He can go to Louisiana Tech? Yep. Or McNeese State? And I don't know, honestly, if you don't go anywhere, how that might work for the summer. Like how you could, dare I say, game the system. Like if you wanted to go to another SEC school, you just can't announce it like now. So, And, and I'm not sure exactly hmm. where the line is drawn in terms of if you go into the portal now, like you could ever go to an SEC school or you'd have to go to a school for a year and then you could go back to one in the regular portal. But that's that's uh, that's an SEC thing. They did that for themselves, they said. Uh, so spring portal, you can't leave an SEC school and transfer into a fellow conference school. But maybe. But maybe, maybe there's a way you can transfer in the summer. In the summer, I don't know. Like I honestly, I don't, I don't know. Or if 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 since you entered the portal in the spring, they're going to hold that against you until next December. That bars you automatically from playing for an SEC. Seems season. like that would be the way to do it. That'd be the common sense way to do yeah. it. Because if we thought of a loophole right there with that I'll, situation, I'll uh, I'll do some homework on that. Yeah, we'll find out. Uh, Tennessee linebacker Elijah Herring is also in the portal. He led the Tennessee defense in tackles last year with 76. This one's interesting. Very interesting. And they were very high on him. And his brother Caleb was number one recruit in the uh, the country, the state, just a couple of years ago. And he was one of their prized recruits not too long ago out of Murfreesboro. Uh, So not sure what's up there other than I would say he's moving on up. But out of Tennessee, maybe into the Big Ten. He could be playing, you know, next year for classic Big Ten traditional favorite Oregon. <laughs> sure. He could he live a lifelong dream of playing, uh, uh, you know, in the classic Oregon Southern Cal Big Ten championship game. I'm sure that's what a lot of kids dream of. Uh, we should probably go Big back Ten country. and find the tape as we continue to drive around the SEC and switch to basketball transfers. I think yesterday you basically predicted this, and today it was made official. Zvonimir Iv- Ivicic. Uh, is going to Arkansas. Yep. His, uh, maybe his meeting with Coach Pope was not as influential as Coach Pope would have hoped for, but this is the first recruit to follow Cal to Arkansas. Uh, in the meantime, Good for them. Uh, Coach Pope did get uh, a highly rated high school kid, Colin Chandler. Uh, I guess he's actually been on a mission the last couple of years uh, for the Mormon Church. Uh, he's a kid from Utah, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. and uh, had, had been... Uh, 
been uh, signed with BYU, but was allowed to get out of his NLI, and he will go with Mark Pope to uh, Kentucky. Pretty good, pretty good numbers by all accounts. But top two, thirty, top thirty in the class. I but believe. two years away, how does that affect you? Probably not too much. I imagine he's been shooting some buckets. Oh, gotta be. Yeah, he's, he's gotta be doing you know, his door door preaching and dropping buckets. Uh, speaking of Kentucky basketball, they've got another one uh, leaving, uh, Ugana Onyensen, uh, who was their leading shot blocker, if I'm not mistaken. Very athletic. Very is uh, headed to straight to the draft, and he, he basically said, I am out. I'm hiring an agent. That lets you know right there. That's the, the, the tip. Like, I'm out. I'm done. Not even thinking about the yeah, answer. Yeah, I am hiring not an even. agent. So, uh, Onyensen will not be a Kentucky Wildcat or a collegiate basketball player next year. Will he be in the NBA next year? First yes. round? First round pick? Second round pick? I think second. Yeah. I, I think second. I think we'll see him start in the G League because he is, he does have great size that you can't teach. He's got really good athleticism. He catches lobs well. Um, defensively, there are some things that he probably wasn't coached very well at Kentucky because none of them play defense really well at all. Mm. But if they're able to fix some of those things, which are definitely teachable at the G League level, I think he'll be playing at least in the uh, at least in the G League next year. Maybe you'll see him on a roster if he gets drafted by a team like I don't know the Hornets, who are usually out of contention two months into the season. Where are they? Um, I believe they're somewhere in North Carolina. Hmm. NBA team? No, maybe New Orleans. There you go. They have two down there. They got the Hornets and the Pelicans. That's right, the New Orleans Hornets. They were the Oklahoma City Hornets for a year. Uh, it was a fun time. I miss the old days of the Hornets, man. I'm telling you, it was fun. It was pre, fun. pre Bobcat Hornets. Yeah, yeah, '90s Hornets, man. I'm telling you, it was a good time. Good time. Uh, baseball tonight in the SEC. Some pretty good games. Air Force is at A and M tonight. A and M already actually has a lead. They're getting that one uh, underway early. Three one A and M in the second uh, tonight. Uh, Bellerman visits Tennessee. Uh, Jacksonville takes on Florida in Gainesville. UAB visits Alabama. Ole Miss travels to Arkansas State. Alcorn State will be at Mississippi State. Vandy staying in Nashville, traveling to Lipscomb. Uh, Kentucky and Louisville do battle tonight in Louisville. Carolina, of course, at the Citadel. We'll talk about that one a lot down in Charleston. Georgia Tech will make the quick drive down 85 over to Auburn. Uh, Missouri is at Missouri State. New Orleans takes on LSU and Baton Rouge. Texas Tech visits Arkansas. Oh, that's a, a good one as well. In fact, they'll play two. That's two weeks in a row that Arkansas is playing two in the midweek against a good school. Uh, they're scheduling tough. I like it. Good for the RPI. Yeah, I, I like it. I like it. There's your, there's your baseball look for tonight in the SEC. Uh, how does Shane Beamer choose teams? For the spring game, here's what Coach had to say about that today. Yeah, you got to do that. You kind of got to give them some direction in there that, you know, a team would get carried away. Let's pick this guy, pick this guy, pick this guy. And eventually you'd have to say, hey, y'all don't have a snapper. So if we kick a field goal or punt, you have no one that can do that as well. Then you have one team last year that realized the other team hadn't picked a snapper. So they tried to pick both snappers so the other team wouldn't have a snapper as well. So the players certainly um, got strategic from that standpoint. But yes, the, uh, and the other part, there are uh, guys that we'll talk about that today in our staff meeting when we meet at 4 o'clock as a staff. There are certain guys that we want just from a continuity standpoint to be able to continue to play together and we've been mixing and matching everybody on the offensive line but we don't want to go out there with a left tackle that's never played all spring next to a left guard and a left guard that hasn't played with a center and a center that hasn't played with that right guard it may not be like the same five that have been together all spring but particularly on the offensive line let's have a little bit of continuity uh, as well so there may be some select like head coach picks that this guy has to be with this guy and if you pick this guy you are also getting that guy uh we'll get all that ironed out today as well yeah i mean it'd be kind of fun actually oh we don't have a snapper <laughs> you just get somebody to go do it right and find the least likely person right. to be the snapper just for giggles yeah uh, the teams, the, the captains do have some leeway, sort of a draft, and a lot of schools like to do it that way and, and try to. And again, listen, I try spring games. I, I, I always, I do this every year, and I have for all my career and, and even before that. Like, don't put too much into anything you see, up, down, sideways, whatever. Don't put, don't too, don't put. You know, if you see somebody, listen. The one thing I think you can see, and I, I think Andy Staples might have said this with somebody of his ilk. Uh, the one thing you might be able to really look at, how do quarterbacks throw the football? You know? Velocity. Yeah, you touch. can just see some of those, you know, the very rare, or, you know, maybe how a running back hits a hole, you know, very, but not 
not in any kind of big, meaningful way. And like, oh, well, our defense is going to be terrible. Oh, the offense doesn't, can't do anything. You know, eh, don't just don't don't let yourself get carried away. Just enjoy it. Have a cold one. You know, cheer for Great. the team. Enjoy the enjoy the light show. Hey, my dad will be at the. Uh, me and my dad are going. Yeah, it's cool, game, man. He, he's never uh, he's never been to I guess an SEC stadium outside yeah. of Knoxville, Tennessee. So sure. he's going to get to experience Willie B for the first time. All right. Well, I hope he realizes that uh, at Williams Price they actually have a seat that you can be comfortable in, <laughs> and not have someone's knees in your back. Because because that really puts the knee in kneeling. Yeah. You're not wrong. Not, You're not wrong at all. I was not. I was not impressed. My first trip to Neyland Stadium, the way Vol fans wanted me to be. The place is built for size and home field advantage, not for comfort at all in the slightest. That's the drive around the SEC, brought to you by Herndon. You can save twenty thousand dollars on new Silverados, Chevy. Together, let's drive. All right, uh, we'll give you some tickets coming up in just a second.
Welcome back in. Final few minutes of the post-game show on this Tuesday. Jay and Elijah with you. All right, as promised, let me do it now. I ran out of time before, so my bad. You know, had a good conversation. Yeah, I can spring yeah, you do what you can. But if you'd like to go see Carolina and Arkansas in the series finale Sunday afternoon at Founders Park, then be caller five right now to 803-404-6100, and Elijah Campbell will personally set you up with a pair of tickets. That's right. They don't call me the ticket fairy around here for nothing. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. Um, and as you're dialing and uh, Elijah's helping you out, I'm going to ask Elijah to uh, give us one more cut from Shane Beamer from earlier today when he was asked about what they might be doing in the spring transfer portal. Yeah, um, I think in a, always with the portal being open, you have to look at how you can make your team better. And that's my job as the head coach. If there's someone that fits what we're about on the field and off the field, it's my job as the head coach to try and get them in here into our program. We're like <clears throat> every program and every coach, David, in that every position, we have a target number of guys that we want to have on scholarship. And some of those positions, some positions were at that position, we're at that number. Other positions were not offensive line right now based on the target number of guys that we would like to have on scholarship we're a couple under um wide receiver right now we're a couple under there's some positions that we might be over but certainly from a depth standpoint being able to practice have a have your full arsenal receiver and offensive line are two positions not that i'm saying we need to get better but just from a depth standpoint being able to practice have a two deep guys on a scholarship those are positions that just uh uh we're not where we want to be as far as the minimum number of guys that we have on scholarship does it mean that it's we're you know in trouble if we don't add people there no but those would be a couple spots that we're looking at just from a depth standpoint for sure yeah you know, it's interesting this time of year because the the evaluation is a little bit different uh again one of the things about the portal right now if for southeastern conference schools at least as i mentioned earlier you can't add someone who's transferring out of a southeastern conference school so not that that's the end all be all by the way on that note seth emerson has reported that uh, Georgia wide receiver Tyler Williams is entering the portal. He was a freshman last season, only played in two games, had one catch. Uh, but again, guys like that can't transfer into the SEC. So interesting to see where some of those guys will go. Um, but, you know, I think for any school right now, you know, you went into spring knowing if, if you know there's a hole somewhere, if spring has told you we've got to go get this guy, then then you're going to go do it. But I don't know that the portal activity is quite as active this time around as it is in the December period. Nowhere near. <laughs> I would say nowhere near as active and nowhere near as many big names. This is uh, kind of like a secondary free agent market, basically. Right. Because a lot of teams, you know, if you're, uh, you know, planning ahead as a football coach, you probably want to be able to organize your roster as much as you can going into the spring thinking, okay, maybe we can trim some of this roster a little bit. And really, with the exception of like Damian Martinez from Oregon State, there are no real game changers, I feel, that are in the portal right now. Elijah Herring from Tennessee could help a defense, you know, but he's, and he's a solid tackler, very mobile, but he's limited to where he can go. So there's not a ton of big names. Right. So you're not going to really make the biggest splash for your roster. Maybe bolstering depth. I think that's really going to be the biggest thing the spring one's for. But, man, the month of December, crazy season. Uh, Elijah tells me that our second winner is Coley. Yes, right. Coley Moore. Way to go, Coley. And uh, the first one was Brian. So Brian and Coley heading to the game, courtesy of Josh Elman and Elijah Campbell. That's right. The ticket fairy blessed. Uh, you've heard a couple of liners uh, tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. Uh, mm -hmm. Big announcement on the early game. I, I Honestly, y'all, I think it's just that Bill Gunner bought a new set of golf clubs. Or a new boat. Ooh, that would be a bigger announcement. Quite literally a big announcement. Yeah. If you got a big boat. I, I'm thinking it's just the golf clubs because I saw him, he was playing last week and he wasn't happy. Or it could be something else. It could be. I don't know. But uh, we'll all find out together tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I'm intrigued. Yeah, I went to now. I, I'm I, showing up to the studio. I never show up that early. I'm showing up. Yeah, I'm not doing that. I got to know. <laughs> Curiosity. You can just be doing me a favor and text me. How about this? I'll video it for you. Thanks. That way you can be there too. I feel like I will. That's good.
Uh, real quick, I want to remind you, go to the uh, uh, 107.5thegame.com website, uh, Palmetto Citizens Grand Slam giveaway, 25 bucks per game added to the pot, $900 right now. They play the Citadel coming up in 45 minutes. First pitch is technically in an hour. Thanks to Stuart Lake for talking about it and joining us today. Uh, yours truly heading down 95 to beautiful Hilton Head, South Carolina. We'll be doing the show tomorrow and Thursday from Harbortown. See you all.